I'd like to welcome you all to the second day of this conference and the fourth panel, which is entitled Medical Treatment Between Necessity and Futility. My name is Abdullah Larian. I'm a professor of Middle East history here at Georgetown in Qatar, and I will be moderating uh, this fourth panel. Um, I'll begin by introducing our uh, special guests, our speakers. Um, first, we have uh, Professor Baroness Elora Finlay, who is a professor of palliative medicine from Cardiff University, who established a diploma MSc in palliative medicine uh, for palliative care in Wales in 2008 to 2017. President of the Chartered Society for Physiotherapy, the Vice President of Hospice UK and of Mary Curie Care, the past President of the BMA, the RSM, and the Association for Palliative Medicine. Also the Chair of the National Mental Capacity Forum for Ministry of Justice and the Department of Health, the Chair of the Board of Governors of Cardiff Metropolitan University, became a life peer in 2001, served on the Select Committee on Assisted Dying for the Terminally Ill, and co-chairs the think tank Living and Dying Well, and is a deputy speaker in the House of Lords. She was also named Welsh Woman of the Year, 1996-97, and has held visiting professorships in the Netherlands and Australia. In 2008, was named Woman Peer of the Year. In 2007, the Parliamentary Charity Champion. And in 2014, Welsh Livery Guild Lifetime Achieve recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award. Also joining us is Dr. Ayman Shabana, who's an associate research professor here at Georgetown University in Qatar. He received his PhD from the University of California in Los Angeles, his MA from Leiden University in the Netherlands, and his BA from Al-Azhar University in Egypt. His teaching and research interests include Islamic legal and intellectual history, Islamic law and ethics, human rights, and bioethics, and he's the director of the Islamic Bioethics Project, which has been supported by three consecutive grants from the Qatar National Research Fund's National Priorities <laughs> Research Program. In 2012, he received the Research Excellence Award at the Qatar Annual Research Forum, and during the academic year 2013-2014, he was a visiting research fellow at the Islamic Legal Studies Program at Harvard Law School. He's the author of Custom in Islamic Law and Legal Theory, in addition to several academic journal articles which appeared in Islamic Law and Society. Oxford Journal of Islamic Studies, Journal of Religion and Science, Hawa, the Journal of Women of the Middle East and the Islamic World, Religion Compass, and Medicine, Healthcare, and Philosophy. Um, so each speaker will have roughly 25 to 30 minutes to speak, and afterwards we'll open it up to a discussion. So please, uh, Baroness, thank you. I was asked to speak on medical treatment and going between uh, necessity and and I think it's important when you're going to make a, tr uh, a decision about is it necessary, is it futile, as... Oh, I'm sorry. I mustn't wander around. I beg your pardon. Not wired for sound. Okay. Uh, when you think about uh, any decision that you're going to make, I think there are a few things. You have to say, is it necessary? Do you have to do it? Or would it be wiser to not do something, masterly inactivity? Is what you're going to do proportionate to the problem that you're dealing with? And how does it match with that person's wishes, values, and feelings? Not those of yourself, the institution, but that person. But most importantly, any decision actually at the end of the day has to be Oops, sorry. Um, the person's decision, not your decision. And to take a decision, they must have the mental capacity to take that decision at that time. So I'm going to try and address those aspects during the next few minutes. I think it's also important to remember that people die of different things around the world. So it's very easy from our highly westernized areas to think about deaths from cancer, but actually in some parts of the world, the pattern of death and dying is really very different indeed. And these are the, just the two WHO maps for cancer and HIV. 
Yet what we do and the way that we behave has to have a moral and ethical consistency, has to be internally consistent around the world, although what we may be dealing with and the resources we have will be different. Cicely Saunders, who is really the founder of the modern hospice movement, said how people die remains in the memory of those who live on. And indeed, John yesterday spoke about the bad experience 20, 30, 40 years ago of somebody which completely influences the way that they approach dying today. So I think it's important to think about what happens before the dying starts in that period when the light is beginning to fade. Think about how people die and what is available because what is available in many countries in the world is far removed from the luxury of the developed countries where we're able to prescribe morphine as we want and so on. But sometimes we resort to morphine more than we ought to and we forget about being the person. The doctor is a, is a medicine, the doctor is the drug the nurse as the, as the demonstration of care and so on. And remembering that those legacy of memories get handed on. So I just want you to think for a moment about your own experience. How many of you have been with more than 20, 30 people who are dying? Right, about half the people in the room. Okay, um, has anyone here not been with one or two people who are dying. Okay. So for you, this is a kind of completely new experience. It's worth, for the rest of you, thinking about your own experience, how you reacted at the time, and particularly in the time before. In um, ethics, we talk about autonomy as if somehow autonomy is a new god in our secular societies. As if uh, we worship autonomy rather than anything else, the self becomes important. And yet people don't recognize it is relational. And Nora O'Neill wrote a very good paper about the relational nature of autonomy. And I put this photo in because this man has got end-stage malignancy. And the decision-making for him was to go home. And the most important thing for him was to be able to hold his grandson. And I think the interconnectedness of two people and what is handed on. And I'm sure as that little boy grows up, that photograph will epitomize his loving grandfather and will probably hugely influence his life. So what about treatment decisions as we take them? Well, we weigh up in that sort of scale pan that we all have in our head clinically. We weigh up the risks and the burdens against the benefits. And that has to be across a large scale. And it is not one big decision. It's lots and lots of decisions every day. It's even down to the decision about, do we turn somebody now? I don't know how many of you have had the experience. I had once of thinking, no, we really must turn this patient. So I went to help a couple of the nurses turn a rather large patient. And that was a bad decision because actually what happened was all his secretions shifted and his breathing went from being quite nice and peaceful to becoming quite stertorous. He died shortly afterwards. Now, he was going to die anyway. We didn't kill him by turning him. But, you know, every decision, it isn't big treatment decisions. It can be what feel like little decisions make a difference to what happens. And when we talk about the decision outcome, we're thinking about the quality and the quantity of life, about how things will be. And of course, we're guessing because we don't know. Cicely Saunders spoke about total pain. 
And I would have to say in all the years that I must have looked after at least 20,000 people who are dying. I have never seen somebody with overwhelming pain who did not have a physical cause to their pain. But I've seen people where people had missed the diagnosis and not realized what the physical cause was, so been treating the wrong thing. But I have seen countless people where that physical experience was dramatically increased because they had distress that was emotional, social, or spiritual. The person in conflict who internally doesn't understand, why me? Why? What did I do to deserve this? Why is God killing me now, leaving my small children? And so on. So it is those domains that you have to look at as well and listen. Otherwise, you won't manage their pain. Just a very brief anecdote, but once uh, some years ago, I admitted a lady because she was on more than one gram of morphine a day and still appeared to be in great pain. And uh, all we did was listen and listen to what had been happening. It turned out, yes, she had breast cancer, yes, she'd got bone metastases, but she had been abused by her husband for many years and felt completely trapped. And when we spent time listening to that emotional and social pain and her spiritual distress, because she'd felt abandoned, She'd been brought up in quite a religious household and felt abandoned. She went home on 30 milligrams of morphine twice a day with good pain control. We didn't change her medication other than to bring it right down. What we did was we just listened in those domains. And indeed, listening is our main therapeutic tool. And this is the Chinese symbol for listening, and I think it kind of says it all. Because you don't just listen with your ears. You listen with who you are. People tell you things because of your professional status. I have been told things many times where people say, I've never told anyone this before, but... And you know that's crucially important. You also listen with your eyes. You look for all those nonverbal cues. Over 80% of communication is nonverbal. But above all, you listen with undivided attention and you listen from the heart. And you all know the person when you're talking to them who isn't listening with undivided attention. They're scribbling, they're computing, they're doing goodness knows what. And you know when they're not listening from the heart. Because the person who's listening from the heart, you feel emotionally that they are empathizing. So what are we trying to do with all these difficult decisions we take and when we decide whether to do something or not do something? Basically, we're trying... Oops. Gone. Oh. Has a wonderful habit of coming and going. It's great. Um, we're trying to improve reality to make today a little bit better and to make tomorrow a little bit better than today. But you can only do that if you help people reset their hopes and aspirations to be realistic. It may be completely unrealistic to plan something six months, so why not bring it forwards and do it in six days? The fastest I've ever arranged a wedding was two and a half hours start to finish. Uh, and it was great. A uh, lady had six children. She wanted to legitimize the children before she died. So one of the nurses went down to a local store and bought six matching dresses in different sizes. It's quite a cheap store, but they were quite nice dresses. Another nurse ran home and brought in her wedding dress because we thought it would probably fit. Uh, our local um, chaplain came and did all the official paperwork, special license and everything. Uh, we found some flowers 
from somebody else's room. I brought them round. Uh, we found uh, a, a bottle of sherry because, you know, we want to have a bit of a celebration. And somebody in the kitchen didn't have time to bake a cake, so ran out, bought one, but then decorated it specially. And then we had to get her brother out of prison. That was the challenge. So, yeah, yeah, we did. He was, he was accompanied by a prison officer, but that was fine. So, going back to that scale pan, deciding what is necessary and proportionate and how it matches someone's values. We need to think about that early, not in that blue box, which is when somebody's dying, dying, dying. You're too late. Right at the beginning, when people are stable, that's the time to have the conversations about, we're doing this, but have you thought what you would want if things don't work out as we hope they will? Have you thought what you would want if your disease progresses faster? And we all hope that we're putting it on hold for a bit. That's the time to dis explore people's values. When you're in a crisis, when something is sudden, unexpected, perhaps a spinal cord compression, it's much more difficult to have conversations then. And then you get that period where people decline. And you, I'm sure those of you that have seen several people dying know you think it'll all go on and it's fine. And then they sort of slide down a slope and they look a bit sweaty and a bit pale. And you think something ain't right. You can't put a finger on it. You need to have a background about what type of person they are and what they want. But throughout all of that phase, through this long journey, the whole time, I think it's worth remembering that you matter because you are you and you matter to the last moment of your life and we will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but to live until you die. This isn't waiting for death, this is about actively living every moment. Great two and a half hours that girl had and actually she died a few days later. But nobody should underestimate the power of the doctor. How many of you ride bicycles? How many of you have been on a tandem? Yeah, okay. So you know the person who holds the handlebars is the person in control. Yeah, my husband always makes me go on the back. <laughs> um, but I, I put myself on the front for this cartoon because actually the doctor has control in the consultation. The way that you steer those, that decision making, you will influence whether you go down the necessary and proportionate road or whether you go down the road of futility. And actually you'll probably shorten your patient's life if you go down futility because you'll do all kinds of unnecessary things and they'll get complications and then they die. But I think it's also worth remembering, this isn't about adults and old people and people with dementia. 6% of the world's children are dying. And in amongst the adult population, there are a lot of young adults dying, leaving children orphaned, particularly in, the, in Africa. The whole parental generation stripped out by HIV AIDS. So even when you're dealing with children, you need to let the family, the whole unit, have a degree of control over how they do things, what they want. This book I would recommend to you if you're looking after children at all, because it was written by mum about Sasha, the boy, who was dying of a brain tumour. And she describes how she struggled against all of the well-meaning professionals to do what Sasha wanted. And everybody knew Sasha was going to be dead soon. So why not let him live to the full and a family live to the full? But the other thing about children is to remember that 
legacy that lives on in them. And looking at school children in Wales, we did a study and found that 10% of school children have suffered a serious bereavement. And I think that that is a low number compared to most other parts of the world where children have lost a parent, a sibling, somebody close to them, a classmate, a teacher. And actually, they need attention and bereavement care needs to come in then too. Because again, you influence the next generation. Because how they make decisions later in life is based on their experience and their memory and how they feel about something. The person who is phobic about going to hospital is going to be much harder to treat than somebody who's easy, happy to have a conversation with you. But don't forget that you, as clinicians, also are influenced. But I, I saw somebody like this before, and it didn't work out, as the guidelines say. That's a huge influence on the way you behave as well, how you steer that handlebars. Uh, Kath Mannix, and referring to Claude, who she worked with, has written a book. And I think that in our more Western world, where we don't see death at home so readily. It's locked away. People are taken to hospital when they deteriorate. You know, he was rushed to hospital. I've never heard of anyone being slowly taken to hospital. They're always rushed. And then they always die. Well, of course they die in hospital because hospital's full of people who are terribly sick anyway. But actually, for most people, dying is not the sudden presence of death, but a gentle absence of life. Life slips away if dying is well managed. And Kath Mannix has written a book of stories, and I really would recommend this to you. It is beautifully written, a fantastic tool for teaching. Little vignettes of patients, and she's put challenges and things to think about afterwards. She's had amazing reviews, being put up for book awards and so on. She was a consultant in Newcastle in the UK. Um, and she describes, too, what happens when a person dies. They become weaker and frailer and slip into a coma. No, they do not go to sleep. You tell a child, mummy will go to sleep, that child will be frightened of going to sleep. No, they slip into a coma and their breathing slows. There's nothing sudden. And then people suddenly notice they're not breathing anymore. There's no heart rate. And then you see those changes and they've died. And I think if you are with somebody and you go a few hours later, They've changed significantly. And I also wonder whether that's actually the soul has now left the body. There's something different. They look different. But let's think of for a moment about all those difficult decisions as you steer that tandem down the road of patient care. Does somebody have capacity to make a decision? Because you can't dump decisions on people. I've seen now more and more people say, well, you know, you have a choice. You could do this or you could do that or you could do the other. What do you want? And then the patient says, well, if you were me, what would you want? And perhaps the conversation, a phrase I quite often use is, look, if you were my brother or my sister or you were my aunt or my uncle or whatever, I think I'd probably veer towards such and such. And they say, great, thank you, doctor, that's what we'll do. They want somebody to guide them who's seen all this before because they haven't seen it before. So what do you need to make any decision? Well, you need accurate information, you need the capacity to take that decision, and it must be voluntary. And that is any decision, whether it's buying a car, a washing machine, consenting to a treatment. And if you are going to decide to end your life through physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia, you couldn't take a bigger decision. So you need these big time. So let me just run over some of the issues. Well, in assessing capacity for a start, 
People have to be able to absorb the information, retain it, think about the implications for self and others, so weigh it up, and then communicate their decision. I've been reading the case reports from the Netherlands, official reports from their euthanasia select committee, and have been alarmed at people with learning difficulties who have had euthanasia, at people with psychiatric illness and depression. That has been the reason they have had euthanasia. I really worry that the capacity assessments have been inadequate. What about the patients on medication? Steroids alter the way people think. Morphine alters the way people think. Amitriptyline alters the way people think. Metabolic disturbance does, and so on, and so on. I think paracetamol probably, there isn't much evidence of it altering capacity, hugely. And the non-steroidals probably not too much. But take an antiemetic like cyclozine, there's evidence that that will actually alter your mental capacity. Now, capacity looks simple, but actually to assess it properly is complicated. People with motor neuron disease, or what uh, most of you will call ALS, 30% um, of them have actually got impaired cognitive ability if you test it properly. And then the other things when people are thinking about a request for death is hopelessness and depression are mutually re reinforcing, major depression of course. Demoralization in the clinician results in demoralization in the patient. So we are infective, the way that we behave influences the patient's mood. And what about information? Well, don't anybody believe that we get diagnoses right because we don't. Post-mortem evidence, the Royal College of Pathologists gave evidence to our select committee and told us one in 20 post-mortems showed the person died of something different to whatever they were being treated for. We are not very good at getting accurate diagnoses. And as for prognosis, well, toss a coin. It's no more accurate than that. It's a guess. My biggest prognostic error was somebody who in 1991, I and three other senior clinicians thought would be dead in three months. Fast forward, he is still alive today. In fact, he was texting me a few days ago because he's under threat of losing his benefits. But in the meantime, he didn't die, but his wife did unexpectedly, and he has brought up the three children alone. And he says, what would have happened to my kids? They would have gone into care. And they're delightful kids. And his son actually does our garden. He set up a gardening business, so I'm still in touch with them as a whole family. But, you know, even when you think someone is dying, 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 and you sit the family down and you say, you know, I really think you should stay overnight and you should call your son and daughter in, etc. well, 3% of those improve. You go round in the ward, round the patient sitting up in bed having breakfast, and the family are completely wrung out. But the difficult one in all of that is the voluntariness. Because I know as a doctor, I cannot detect coercion. I cannot detect the person whose family, through subtle conversations, have made them realize that they're becoming a burden. That their financial costs of care are draining the inheritance from the next generation. And I'm afraid not all families are loving families. Most are. But I've been taken in big time. And I think I'm quite cynical. But I really have. And what about the influence of the demoralized doctor? That is a pressure. That's a, co you know, oh, well, I'm sorry. There's nothing more that we can do. What a damning statement. I'll abandon you, it says. And the doctor judge voluntariness? No. You see, we can't go and say, can I see your bank account? Can I see your will and when you changed it? 
We can't cross-examine or interrogate what's going on in a household, which a judge can. <coughs> so we will never know that the money's leaking out the bank account, that the will's recently been changed to leave it all to somebody else, and so on and so on. And then yesterday, and I put this in because it came up in discussion yesterday, about best interest decisions. And I think it's really dangerous. People don't understand best interest decision making. It is not about your interests or the interests of your service. It is what is in the best interest of the person in front of you. Their wishes, their feelings, their values. It's that weighing up. And so, even if somebody appears confused, you must still encourage participation. Identify everything that's relevant and find out all you can about them. What type of person were they? And have they made an advanced decision to refuse treatment? So, have they made a do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation order. I hope nobody will go away from today talking about do not resuscitate because it is rubbish. Everything you do is resuscitative. You give a dehydrated patient's fluids, you're resuscitating them. An ins insulin to a diabetic, sugar to somebody who's hypo, Antibiotics to somebody who's bordering going into sepsis, those are all resuscitation. Even catheterizing somebody who's in severe retention actually is a form of resuscitation because if you don't, the outcome would be absolutely terrible. So it's very specific. If you're not going to do something, what is it you're not going to do and why are you not going to do it? And actually, in people who are dying, 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 CPR is not going to do anything anyway. So what's the point of running down the corridor, disrupting everybody? Why not let people sit there peacefully, holding a hand by the bedside, having a cup of tea? So much better than a zap and the body jumping on the bed and you know that they're dead anyway. But the other thing is, actually, can things be improved? So if you took the dose of steroids down, would their head clear? If they had a little bit less analgesia, so they got rid of those fuzzy side effects but still maintain the analgesia, would they think more clearly? Would that be better? Make a decision. And it's really important to remember, and it is in UK law, in the Mental Capacity Act, that your decision, the best interest decision, must not be motivated to bring about the person's death. And the reason, of course, is you have no interest when you're a corpse. When you're a corpse, you're a corpse. And it is the duty of somebody else to dispose of that mass of dead cells. You have no interest. Even if you made a will, you handed over property, you've transferred those interests to somebody else. They're no longer yours. But whilst you're alive, you have interests. And you can still, even if it's a minimal level, have cognition. And I worry about people who get labeled as things like um, prolonged uh, disorders of consciousness who actually have locked-in syndrome. About 48 of percent of people with locked-in syndrome are not, are not diagnosed properly, and they actually have a, a huge degree of awareness that people had never realized. So what about refusing treatment? Well, if you're refusing treatment, you can't be treated without consent, and you can refuse something even if it's life-prolonging, but it must be the patient's decision to refuse or you're not even instigating, or you're withdrawing because it's futile. And you are not killing the patient. Take someone on a ventilator. They would have already died from their disease. Previously, the ventilators kept them alive. You take them off the ventilator for whatever reason. You care for them using the guidance we have. They die peacefully, on average, within 35 minutes. Not distressing, not breathless, you manage that. That is completely different to euthanasia, where you give them an, an overdose of drugs deliberately to 
bring their death forward in time and they would have lived for days, weeks, months or years. You do not know. I hope that's clear. When you're stopping or withdrawing treatment, they're dying of their disease. Funnily enough, there is 100% mortality associated with life. So they're going to die at some point of their disease. You haven't killed them. In around the world, of course, there are different bits of legislation. And just to clarify, and if I may take two minutes, and I'm in praying indulgence here, um, so please bear with me. And if you want me to shut up, just go like that now. Okay, nobody's cut my head off, that's fine. Um, this is not about a little bit more morphine. This is not about putting up a syringe driver because they can't swallow anymore. For assisted suicide, they take nine or 10 grams of barbiturate. The most that you would ever use therapeutically today would be 200 milligrams to control fitting, which you can't control by any other means. So just do the sums, 200 into 10, 200 milligrams, 10 grams, okay, it is a massive overdose. What do you do for euthanasia? Well, you inject a short-acting anesthetic agent sometimes followed up by a curare-like substance or sometimes mixed now in Belgium because apparently they got the syringes the wrong way round a couple of times. And the person is totally paralyzed, can't move a muscle, they die of asphyxia. Okay, that is this wonderful peaceful death that people talk about. Nobody has any idea if they've regained consciousness or not, because it's not monitored. And when you look at them, they look as if they're peaceful because they're totally paralyzed. So what's happening? Well, it does seem to take off a bit, doesn't it? The blue line is the number of prescriptions written in Oregon, and the orange line is the number of deaths in Oregon. Oregon is a very small state, 3.8 million. It's only a tiny bit bigger than Wales, but their numbers are going up. What about completely different socioeconomic and cultural area. <coughs> well, uh, Oregon's been held up as a model to many places, but actually it's been described as being no better than a leaky boat. Because one of the th criteria is that people must have a six month prognosis. Well, you can't tell that anyway. But in fact, that six months is based on what would happen if their condition wasn't treated. So every, every insulin-dependent diabetic is immediately eligible because if you don't give insulin to a diabetic, they will die. One of, in the pre-insulin era, one of our relatives aged 23 died of diabetes. Died quite rapidly because he had di no insulin, no nothing. So it's really not as watertight as people claim. And in the Netherlands, where they have euthanasia, they can also have physician-assisted suicide, but once you've got euthanasia, it hardly ever happens. That's the numbers going up year on year. About one in 23, one in 24 of all deaths, all causes are now by euthanasia. In Belgium, it's higher than that. It's probably about one in 22. And in Belgium, they probably only know about half of the deaths that there are by euthanasia. It becomes really normalized across society. And what are the problems? I think the big problem is that we're actually living with uncertainty all the time and we don't recognize it. We kid ourselves that there's certainty. They, we kid ourselves that we can make decisions and what we decide will happen. No, it won't. Life is not like that. I hope every one of you gets home safely. But the chances are that on the way home, something will happen to some of you. If all it is is that you lose your luggage, then that's great. God has been good to us all. But it may be somebody has a nasty fall, gets a head injury. Heaven forbid the plane falls out the sky. Who knows? We don't know. And yet we pretend that we can control things. And we can't. So thank you for listening and indulging the time. So one of the central questions in Islamic bioethical discourses revolves around the moral status of medical treatment. Islamic scriptural uh, sources include references 
that emphasize both physical and spiritual health. Quran <clears throat> is described as an important source of healing, and one of the divine names and attributes is the healing of God, of course. While some references underline the power of faith in the, in the face of spiritual as well as physical ailments, other references don't rule out the utility of medical treatment. Some references also emphasize the religious significance of illness and its role in the expiation of one's sins. They indicate that the proper attitude of a believer in such circumstances should be marked <laughs> with genuine faith and trust in God's will. These different scriptural sources inspired extensive discussions in the Islamic tradition on the ethical legal status of medical treatment. But beyond mere permissibility or impermissibility, these normative discourses reveal particular views on important theological questions such as the efficacy of causes, divine knowledge, and human destiny. These multi-layered discussions have also inspired and informed important trends within Islamic philosophy and mysticism. Just to illustrate <clears throat> this, I would like to give you a sampling of the texts that uh, I was referring to. Uh, Asim already went over some of them yesterday, but I thought it would be useful for the purpose of this presentation just to give you, you know, some examples of the main references in the foundational text that uh, basically address this issue of medical treatment, or at least that are often invoked in, in discussions like, like this. So in the Quran, the Quran itself is described as a source of spiritual healing, of course, but also it includes references to some means and methods of uh, physical healing. So uh, on the one hand, we have uh, this uh, passage, uh, chapter 1782, we send down of the Quran that which is a healing and a mercy to those who believe. Uh, reference to spiritual, uh, to physical means of, uh, of treatment or cures include this famous reference in, in chapter 16 about uh, honey, for example, as a, as a source of healing. Ultimately, God is described, and this is in uh, Abraham, Ibrahim, who's quoted in chapter 26, 80, as saying, when I fall sick, it is he who heals me. Perhaps use this one instead. So, uh, similarly, in the Sunnah of the Prophet, we have also several passages, actually uh, more references in the Sunnah, indeed. And... Uh, one of the most important references is actually this hadith uh, that indicates that each ailment has a cure. God did not send down uh, a disease without sending down its cure. So what is uh, interesting and also intriguing about this particular report is that it has been narrated uh, in, in, in different hadith collections uh, differently. So there are different narrative, uh, narrations, if you will. Uh, in one narration, for example, uh, some exceptions were made or were indicated, and these include uh, al-hiram, which is old age. So each disease, each ailment has uh, a cure except old age. And in another narration, the exception is death, a uh, sam. So this hadith has always been used in order to encourage, you know, this continuous search for cure, for, uh, you know, an effective treatment. And that includes all types of diseases. Uh, for example, according to one uh, commentary that is in, in, in Fath al-Bari uh, by uh, Ibn Hajar, for example, he said that includes terminal illness as well. Because after all, from a theological perspective, nothing is impossible for God. So 
So he says, it includes terminal illness that the most skilled of physicians have recognized as incurable and they admitted their inability to deal with it. So in Arabic, I thought I should quote it for those who know Arabic because I think it's important. وَيَدْخُلُ فِي عُمُومِهَا الْمَرَضُ الْقَاتِلُ الَّذِي اعْتَرَفَ حُذَّاقُ الْأَطِبَّاءُ بِأَنْ لَا دَوَاءَ لَهُ وَأَقَرُّ بِالْعَجْزِ عَنْ مُدَوَاتِهِ So even in cases of terminal illness, there should be hope and there should be an effort to be made in order to uh, do what is uh, appropriate. So along with this basic uh, hadith or report, and uh, this hadith similar to, uh, to other uh, similar hadith also generated over time an uh, impressive number of commentary in the books of hadith, but more importantly, as I will explain later, also in, uh, in the legal tradition. And that has been demonstrated in the various juristic legal opinions in the various legal schools. Another interesting and also rather intriguing uh, prophetic report is the one that uh, indicates that contagion is not effective. So the, the text of the hadith is no contagion, no bad omen from birds, no ham, no bad omen in, in, in the month of Safar, and one should flee from the leper as one would flee from a lion. So what's interesting about this report is that it somehow tries to address some pre-Islamic Arabian practices, right? Tries to put an end to these kind of uh, uh, beliefs, right? Wrong beliefs from an Islamic perspective uh, that, that the Arabs used to, to harbor and to, to believe. Uh, but what is interesting here is that it, it, the hadith seems on the face of it to indicate, you know, uh, two different things, even oppositions, or uh, some would say even contradictions. So on the one hand, it negates contagion, but on the other, it ends with an advice, or in, in a, a piece of advice to flee from the one who has leper, which is a contagious disease. And of course, in the commentary, there are all types of explanations and efforts made, actually, heroic of efforts speaking of palliative care and end-of-life issues, to try to reconcile these two elements of the hadith. Another uh, slightly different narration of the hadith includes also, uh, or indicates that no contagion, no bad omen in the month of Safar, no ham, and uh, this particular narration uh, uh, captures or it speaks about an, an incident that happened at the, uh, the time of the Prophet in which one Bedouin uh, said, O Prophet of God, camels are usually healthy, but when a manji comes close to them, they contract the disease. Upon which the Prophet then said, who or what brought the disease to the first? So here the Prophet, if you will, is uh, drawing people's attention to the original cause or the prime cause, if you will, which is God. He's, he's behind these apparent causes. Again, there are some other reports uh, indicating that the sick should not transmit the disease to the healthy. So while there, there is no contagion, but still people need to care for each other and need to also consider these apparent causes, because at the end of the day, this is, these are the causes that have been instituted in the universe, and God, you know, with his infinite powers, he is beyond these causes. But as far as human, uh, human uh, kind is concerned, they need to address, they need to factor in, and they need to respect these, these causes. Also, some ahadith, especially those that talk about prayer, uh, during times of illness, uh, always invoke the name of God as the healer or al-shafi. Uh, a very interesting group of uh, reports talk about the, the notion of reliance on God, and this has always also been uh, discussed in relationship to these other reports, and uh, scholars of hadith and fiqh, of course, particularly within People who have some sort of Sufi orientation 
always wanted to reconcile these uh, dimensions of these references. How, uh, on the one hand, you are supposed when you get sick to take medication, but at the same time, you trust in God. And whether these two elements kind of go hand in hand or whether they contradict each other. So what all that means is that uh, there has to be some sort of interpretation or reconciliation of these different or disparate references. So uh, there is a need for an interpretive framework, and that interpretive framework would uh, include elucidation or explanation of uh, important methodological issues that the usulis or legal theorists have uh, addressed and talked about, like uh, distinguishing between the different roles of the prophet, the different roles that he served in his life, either as a communicator of divine revelation, as a judge, as a ruler, or as a human being. When it comes to the prophet's action, whether these actions are meant for legislative purposes or whether these are habitual kind of actions. Also, in classifying these different prophetic reports, uh, attention should be given to two main considerations, which is or origin or origination, thubut, and signification, which is dalala. And finally, and ultimately, and perhaps most importantly, you need to factor in this kind of theological lens through which you look at these references. And of course, that reminds us in, in, in the legal tradition and theological tradition, you have these various theological schools who had their own particular understanding and interpretation of all these different uh, pro uh, prophetic reports. So my point is, it, is, it would be <laughs> inaccurate to approach these various prophetic reports or even Quranic references in an atomistic way that you just you know, capitalize on one relevant or one pertinent or one uh, uh, single report or reference in a, in a kind of an opportunistic way in order to make the point that this or that point or this or that view is the most important or the most relevant or the most correct. If you will. So this presentation, which is part of a larger study on the issue of medical treatment, examines the main contours of these discussions with a view to investigate the extent to which pre-modern discussions on medical treatment shape Islamic bioethical discourses. In the modern period, contemporary religious debates on a wide spectrum of bioethical issues, ranging from vaccination, medical testing, uh, also for the purpose of this conference, palliative care and end-of-life issues, including euthanasia, show the importance of these pre-modern discussions on the question of medical treatment. Examining the relevance of this issue to contemporary bioethical discourses, the presentation will analyze the juristic deliberations on this theme that were hosted by the International Islamic Fiqh Academy of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation during its seventh session in 1992. So, considering the comprehensive scope of the Islamic legal corpus, which includes ethical legal assessment of the acts undertaken by legally competent individuals pertaining to all aspects of their lives, one would expect to find juristic discussions on a wide range of questions that fall under the scope of medical ethics or bioethics. Despite occasional reservations and uh, skepticism on the validity, utility, or efficacy of medicine, it was held in high esteem in the Islamic tradition, and medical practice was considered a collective duty, fard kifaya, due to the great need for it both at the individual and societal levels. More particularly, it was deemed essential for the preservation of life which is considered one of the five necessary values constituting the higher objectives of Sharia, together with religion, intellect, progeny, and property. Analogies were often made between medicine and Sharia. Professor Musa already uh, quoted uh, Rizuddin ibn Abdul Salam, and this also comes from him. Uh, while the former aims to ensure the well-being of the body, the latter aims to ensure the spiritual well-being of the believer, both in, the life and, uh, in this life and in the hereafter. Arabic terms for illness and healing occur in the Quran, both in the physical as well as the spiritual sense.
And the Quran itself, as I indicated early, earlier, is referred to as a source of healing. Similarly, the prophetic sunnah includes numerous references to medical issues to the extent that standard collections of hadith, hadith reports, include chapters dedicated to medicine, a tub, as well as endorsement of specific therapeutic practices, tadawi. These scriptural references came to form the substance of a sizable body of literature known as prophetic medicine. <coughs> Atub al-Nabawi, which also reflects pre-Islamic Arabian healing practices, as Ibn Khaldun indicated. Together with this prophetic medical tradition, another philosophical medical tradition developed after the classical Greek tradition. These two par parallel traditions have existed side by side, and their interaction is often highlighted in connection with the concept of Islamic medicine. The pre-modern juristic debate on the permissibility of pursuing medical treatment can be traced to early scholarly efforts to reconcile scriptural references, which seem to point at different directions. While some prophetic reports, include, including those recording prophetic precedents, indicate the permissibility and even necessity of seeking medical treatment, others emphasize the importance of trust, trusting God or trusting in God and putting one's faith in his ability to heal diseases without any intervening causes. For example, reports advocating the pursuit of medical treatment include God did not send a disease except that he uh, sent along with it a suitable cure. On the other hand, other reports advocating total reliance on God may imply avoidance of medical treatment. In light of these references, five main juristic views were developed concerning the question of medical treatment, and these are recommendation, obligation, permissibility, permissibility with preference for avoiding medical treatment, and finally, impermissibility. The first view, which is recommendation of medical treatment, is adopted by the majority of the Shafi'is and some Hanbalis on the basis of several prophetic reports indicating the importance of seeking medical treatment and also on the basis of actual precedents showing the Prophet's use of medical treatment. In support of this view, the Hanbali jurist Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah argues that seeking medical treatment confirms the connection between causes and their ensuing effects which does not necessarily conflict with uh, putting one's faith in God. Belief in divine omnipotence calls for respecting rather than neglecting the causes that God link to certain effects. The second view, which is obligation of medical treatment, is adopted by some Hanafis and some Hanbalis, especially if the efficacy of treatment could be ascertained. In this case, according to this view, neglecting medical treatment amounts to intentionally harming or even killing oneself, which is explicitly prohibited in the Quran. The third view is adopted by the majority of Hanafis, the Malikis, and some Hanbalis. According to this view, seeking medical treatment is permissible, as long as one believes that healing can only be caused by God. The fourth view is adopted by the majority of Hanbalis and some Shafi'is. According to this view, seeking medical treatment is permissible, but avoiding it may be preferable because such attitude demonstrates one's faith in God's healing power. For example, the 11th century Ash'ari theologian and Shafi'i jurist Al-Ghazali listed some situations in which he argued avoiding medical treatment could be preferable and these are, if the person believes on the basis of Gnostic knowledge, kashf, that his life term has come to an end and that medical treatment is of no use. If the person is so occupied by his spiritual condition and concern for salvation in the hereafter that he cannot attend to his physical ailment, which makes him less responsive to the instructions of the treating physician. If the person suffers from a chronic disease with no known or certain cure. 
If the person intends illness as a means to increase his record of good deeds or expiate past sins. Finally, if the person fears that treating his illness would affect his self-consciousness and increase the level of distraction. The fifth attitude advocates the impermissibility of medical treatment if it involves some form of prohibited treatment, such as use of religiously prohibited material or practice. Which, of course, should be uh, evaluated on a case by case basis in case of necessity. This attitude is also attributed to some mystics who argue that seeking medical treatment conflicts with one's faith in God and his healing power. As noted above, contemporary Islamic bioethical discourses draw on these pre modern discussions in the Islamic normative tradition as a, as a resource to address the new questions that modern biomedicine raises. Examples include, although not limited to, the permissibility of organ donation as well as the possibility of withdrawing or withholding medical treatment at end-of-life situations. The 1992 OIC Fiqh Academy deliberations were based on four papers, two by physicians and two by legal experts. That's Muhammad Ali Albar and Muhammad Adnan Saqqal, the physicians, and Muhammad Yusuf Muhammadi and Abdullah Muhammad Abdullah, the jurists. In general, physicians' presentations tended to highlight the role of clinical practice in determining the need or the necessity of medical treatment, suggesting that such assessment should be tied to tangible indicators such as the nature of the illness and also potential impact on the patient's life as well as that of others. For example, Albar notes that medical treatment should be obligatory in two main situations. The first includes dangerous communicable diseases, particularly in the case of epidemics, which may, if necessary, justify the enforcement of quarantine and placing limitations to the freedom of affected individuals or regions. In these cases, the responsibility to enforce medical treatment or other appropriate measures falls upon the government through ministries of public health and other similar entities. The second situation is not limited to communicable diseases, but it includes diseases for which medications are available and recovery is certain or near certain. Treatment in this case would enable the individual to regain his health and avoid being dependent on others thereby benefiting not only himself, but also the larger society. Although treatment in this case should be obligatory, it comes second in order after the first case of communicable diseases. Ultimate responsibility to pursue treatment in this case falls upon the individual as long as they are competent adults. In the case of minors or incompetent adults, other measures of surrogate decision-making should be put in place. According to Albar, foregoing medical treatment can be an option in certain cases, which include diseases with no available medications or with medications which, uh, which involve harmful consequences or side effects. They may also include conditions in which recovery is merely probable or even less likely. In these cases, medication may end up adding to the suffering of the patient and to his family as well. On the other hand, presentations and comments by the jurist tended to reiterate the pre-modern juristic opinions. While some jurists chose the views indicating that medical treatment should be mandatory or at least recommended, particularly in the case of curable diseases, others insisted that in general, medical treatment should remain at the level of permissibility. According to the former opinion, the totality of scriptural evidence, as well as the personal example of the prophet, are in favor of seeking medical treatment. Moreover, according to this opinion, views discouraging medical treatment could be explained in light of contemporary medical knowledge and lack of effective cures. That's at the time of the Prophet. 
two main issues were highlighted in that uh, in these deliberations hosted by the Fiqh Academy. These are medical treatment in the case of incurable or terminal illness and the role of the patient's consent. These two issues, on the issue of medical treatment in terminal cases, participants drew on three main sources to formulate an opinion, even if a tentative one. And these are scriptural references de-emphasizing the need or the necessity of medical treatment, often involving precedents going back to the Prophet and other exemplary figures in the early Muslim generations, Three modern scholarly views downplaying the importance of medical treatment, at least in certain cases, and modern medical indication, indicators on the futility of medical treatment in the case of terminal or incurable diseases. Similarly, on the issue of uh, the patient's consent, participants found support in scriptural sources involving certain precedents going back to the prophet and also in pre-modern discussions, particularly on the issue of medical liability. These modern deliberations also reveal the larger theological underpinnings of certain legal discussions pertaining to medical issues, such as the religious significance of illness, the connection between illness and belief in destiny, the proper attitude of the patient, and the true meaning of reliance on God. For example, some of the participants uh, invoked or reiterated the, uh, the view uh, expressed by Al-Ghazali, again, who divided the causal connection between treatment and healing into three main types. First is definitive, or speculative, or imaginary, maqtu' mavnoon, or mawhum. The meaning of reliance on God differs for each of these types. For example, the first type is illustrated by the occurrence of satiation after eating, eating bread, for example. Uh, and in this case, true reliance on God means observing, considering, and fulfilling this causal connection. Disregarding this connection would be prohibited, especially if it leads to death. The third type is illustrated by cauterization, well, K, because its curative effect cannot be confirmed. In this case, reliance on God means disregarding this type of treatment. The second type covers a wide range of medical procedures, such as cupping, whose curative effect is only speculative. This type, of, <clears throat> this type occupies an intermediary stage between the first and the third types and is subject to the discretion of, in, of the individual. <laughs> Observing this type is not antithetical to true reliance on God as is the case with the third type and disregarding it is not prohibited as is the case with the first type. The resolution that was issued at the end of the deliberation indicates that, in principle, seeking medical treatment is legitimate, but the exact ruling may vary for different individuals depending on different circumstances. For example, it can be obligatory if avoiding medical treatment would result in one's death, incapacity, or failure of one's organ, organs, vital organs. It would also be obligatory in case uh, one's disease would transmit to others if left untreated, as is the case with contagious diseases. If the disease would result in mere weakness in the body rather than death or loss of organs, treatment in this case would be recommended but not obligatory. Apart from these two cases, medical treatment would be just permissible. Finally, medical treatment would be reprehensible in case it leads to further complications or deterioration of one's health. With regard to incurable diseases, the resolution indicated that pursuit of medical treatment conforms to the causes that have been instituted in the universe, but at the same time, it emphasized divine omnipotence and healing power 
which is reminiscent of some classical commentaries on some prophetic reports, particularly the one emphasizing the existence of a cure for every type of ailment. Regardless of the prognosis of any given disease or condition, treating physicians and family members should do their best to raise the morale of patients and to alleviate their suffering. Ultimately, determination of whether a particular disease is incurable should be made by qualified physicians in light of available medical knowledge. Finally, with regard to patient consent, the resolution indicated that consent by the, the patients is required in the case of competent adults and of legal guardians in the case of minors or incompetent adults. Governments may enforce appropriate measures in certain cases, such as the outbreak of epidemics and also in other cases of emergency. Subsequent juristic bioethical discussions on medical treatment, particularly with reference to terminal illness and end-of-life situations, tend to reiterate the views expressed in these 1992 deliberations, including the questions that still remain open, such as withdrawing, withholding life-sustaining treatment, as well as the use of artificial nutrition and hydration, administration of pain-relieving medications, communication of distressing or bad news, and surrogate decision-making. For example, the IOMS International Islamic Code for Medical Ethics on the issue of euthanasia condemns any act that is meant to put an end to the life of a terminally ill patient. It indicates that treatment of incurable diseases is not obligatory. Moreover, it includes it, in, uh, it indicates that withdrawing or withholding curative procedures in these cases may be possible, provided that the fundamental, fundamental rights due to the patient, such as dehydration, nutrition, uh, uh, proper uh, nursing, care, and pain relief are made available. So in conclusion, while these deliberations among Muslim jurists and medical professionals on the religious moral status of medical treatment highlight the role of religious faith at times of illness, especially in the case of terminal diseases, they also emphasize the importance of seeking medical treatment, especially when effective cures are available. In general, these contributions aim to reconcile Islamic discourses on medical treatment with modern medical values and ethics. For example, side by side with Islamic concepts concerning illness, cure, and healing, one also sees modern ethical concepts such as informed consent within both clinical as well as research settings. Contemporary discussions on the topic of medical treatment serves as a significant illustrative example of how contemporary Islamic bioethical discourses grapple with two distinct traditions. They seek to address and accommodate modern questions and needs from within the extended Islamic normative tradition. These needs and questions, however, have largely emerged in response to modern, that is, Western medical practice and technology. While the latter have been adopted and utilized with little reservation, if any, Western medical ethics have, at least in part, been contested. From this perspective, Islamic bioethical discourses provide the necessary process of legitimization that modern Western medical ethics require in a, in a Muslim setting. With regard to the issue at hand, these contributions show that the ethical legal status of medical treatment should be linked to proper categorization of medical conditions along with anticipated outcomes and effectiveness of available cures. Ultimately, in the absence of clear and binding legislation, this body of religious moral deliberations remains the main resource for ethical decision-making on issues related to medical treatment, particularly in cases of terminal illness within the Muslim context. Thank you. The comment is that we learn from Baroness uh, lecture and also Dr. Ayman's lecture that all of us will die 
that is certain. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and that we don't really know when we are going to die. So these two are clear. And so for us, for as doctors, um, we should be careful of what message that we give to the mission. And I have many stories like what you told about people uh, living so many years when we told them they have only weeks and months to, to live. Many, many years, actually. And the, but we have a little bit of problem in our local re region about child um, parents refusing to uh, give permission for children to be treated. And um, our child children protection laws are not mature enough as I saw them in Europe and all where the social services take over. And, and that's one point. And the other point, we are trying to win the parents to be with us rather than against us. So we're trying to <laughs> convince rather than go against their decision. So how do you approach it? Maybe you could give both perspectives from the two sides. Uh, thank you. I, I wasn't aware that your child protection uh, n means that you have children who are not being treated with treatable conditions. Wow. Right. I, I mean, it's interesting because in the UK, we've just had a big case called, uh, the child was called Charlie Gard, where the um, physicians wouldn't allow an experience so-called experimental treatment and actually they treat they, the physician's attitude to the parents was terrible um, and th there's going to be more coming out from that so I wouldn't want anyone to think we've got it right in the UK because we haven't it's it's swung too much the other way I think as a kind of general rule I would say if you give people information and you give it in terms that they realize that you understand their distress, then that can unlock a block of communication. And there are a couple of examples. I, there is a phrase I sometimes use, which is to say, I realize that this is terrible for you and terribly distressing. And I am not here to make anything more difficult than it is already. And then may go on to say, you and I have a common enemy, this illness. Nobody wants it. And the question is, can we together find a way to manage this illness but accept that we are doing our best efforts. <clears throat> and then sometimes leave it at that for a time. Um, and sometimes it takes quite a long time for people to realize you're not part of the disease. The disease is out there and you are with them. You're wanting to work with them. But I think there's some very basic feelings in out there generally in society, irrespective of race, religion, or anything, that somehow the association of the doctor with disease, with hospital, with treatment, therefore you, you must be all part of that bad thing, uh, and you have to extricate yourself and, and in a way from that association. Thank, thank you uh, for, for both presentations. Uh, uh, Dr. Um, Shabana, you, you went in quite detail about the various law schools and what they say and so on. Uh, do you still think that there's some traction for those kind of divisions in, this, in the Sunni sphere uh, and that opinions will be judged according to whether they are validated by the Shafi or the Hanbali or the Maliki school and so on? So I wondered if you had some thoughts about that. Uh, Baroness Finley, thank you very much for, for your uh, presentation. I was wondering if I understood you correctly about do not resuscitate. 
So I understood your various examples. You said that you know insulin and all those other ways that we do uh, we do resuscitate in that ways. But the standard understanding, I'm not a physician, so I, I'll need your help here. What are you saying? Why should we not take do not resuscitate seriously? Maybe if you could repeat what you said there, or I, maybe I mis misunderstood that. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, thank you both. So, uh, anyway, I'm going to try to put the, uh, the presentations together for a second to ask you to pontificate and think outside what you've presented. Um, so, so, so the Baroness made a point, and I want to take that characterization of medicine, where she said something to the extent that, and she can clarify, um, when you think about a person with cancer, we, what we do in medicine is we're trying to push off that cancer ultimately um, being the cause of their death by a certain amount of years or days or months. What we're doing is managing that disease. I mean, anybody, if you take, uh, I have, a, have family members and other people who have cancer, it's always in their back of their mind that they have cancer. They don't say they're cured. They're always worried that the next back pain they have is that cancer coming back, okay? So they're, for the rest of their life, they have that disease whether you think about it or not. And when you look at the medical history, it's on that chart. So my point is that's what medicine is. It's management of chronic symptoms of hypertension, kidney disease, or forestalling what we think is gonna come back and be their cause of death. It is not this notion of I'm gonna cure someone. And so the problem I have and what I want you to find, so forget about, I mean not forget about, we can talk to Professor Mufus and think about legal schools, but whether the conceptualization of Tadawi is actually accurate in the way that the jurists are thinking about it, even in 1992 with, premier physicians contemplating what to do in that status, right? That do they actually have a conceptualization of medicine as a management system? And are those rulings even relevant to the physician and the patient interaction today? Um, I have my own views on that, but I want you to pontificate from what your research was. Thank you. Uh, this is also for Baroness Finley. I appreciate the distinction you made uh, between removal of life-sustaining support and the conscientious intervention, uh, that uh, conscious intervention inducement that euthanasia is, um, even to the examples that you gave of stopping uh, insulin treatment six months in advance is really a conscious intervention, whereas uh, Removal of a hospitalized patient with life support is removal of something that is really prolonging life and that death would have be taking place anyway. But could you comment on why some of the highest teaching Catholic authorities confuse this? <laughs> it often happens and then it becomes part of public debate and then the whole distinction gets terribly confused again. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Professor Musa. Uh, about tractions or traction for these pre modern uh, juristic views. Um, judging from these deliberations in the modern period, because these deliberations are happening now, right, or uh, recently, and actually, uh, you know, the, the views expressed there or the resolutions or the decisions are not. Uh, are not categorical, but but oftentimes they 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 are framed in a in a kind of a contingent way, or uh, you know something that is tentative. In other words, it's open for uh, for addition, for amendments, depending on the advances in in the uh, in medicine and biomedical technology, etc. So, judging from these deliberations, yes, these pre-modern uh, discussions and views are important and relevant, and this is why they are being invoked, you know, over and over again. <clears throat> but but I think, again, judging from these deliberations, they, they are invoked as a resource, just, just for inspiration, if you will, uh, for more uh, views or opinions that are appropriate for the present uh, circumstances, you know. Uh, and I think this ties with, with uh, the question that Asim brought, which is you know, the conceptualization of medicine, and to what extent the conceptualization that these pre-modern jurists had, and how, how much it is 
relevant or similar to current understanding of medicine? This is your question, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But but the question that I would I would push back and then raise another question and said that conceptualization that these pre-modern uh, jurors or even jurors in 1992 had what is the source of that conceptualization? It's coming again from medical practice. I mean, of that time, and you know from technical expertise, right? And what's interesting to note here is that these jurors, when they cite medicine or scientific. Uh, views, they often cite them on the authority of experts, right? So, and, and then also, uh, they are often cited with the caveat that, okay, depending on what the experts say, right? So what goes in the pre-modern period, I guess, would go for the, for the present time in the sense that <clears throat> uh, testing or assessing or evaluating this conceptualization will be subject to verified information in these respective fields, right? This is at least how, 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 I, how I read it. Okay, thank you. Um, good questions, thank you. I'm not dismissing somebody who says do not resuscitate. What I'm saying is be precise. Do you want antibiotics? Do you want them by mouth, but not intravenously? Do you want to go back on a ventilator the next time you're in respiratory failure? You might say, no, next time I'll just have oxygen by mask. What is the ceiling of care? Where's the limit that's acceptable to you? But when people say, oh, do not resuscitate, sometimes that gets interpreted as abandoning all care, which is really dangerous. So that's um, to answer you. And thank you for asking that. Um, I completely agree. We cure nothing in medicine apart from meningitis with antibiotics and possibly a couple of other sepsis things. And the problem we've got with all of the scriptures all around the world, they were all written before that wonderful little mold plate that Alexander Fleming saw in the medical school that I went to. But he was before my time. I'm not that old. <laughs> okay. So all those scriptures, great basis but the science of today was not there. We did not even have, you know, electricity was a concept that none of them had had. Even when my father was a child, they went to bed with a candle. They had no electricity. Now you know how old I am. Um, so I, I think that's a problem. We're taking things from previously and pretending that they're completely applicable today. They are as a basis. But antibiotics have, yeah, they've revolutionized care. And so what are we doing now? We're abusing them. And probably in 10, 20 years, we won't have antibiotics. And we will be back where people were all those decades, centuries ago, with people dying of infections that today we can treat because we've abused what, we, what we've got in hand. So we don't cure things, no. We live with disease, we control disease. Sometimes we do a really good job and we control it for years. Sometimes we do a really bad job and we think we've controlled it and it pops up again weeks or months later. Um, why do I think people get it confused? Well, two reasons. One is the reason I've said, I think these, you know, that you have to look at modern science. The other problem is so called experts. Who are experts? Experts are people who tell you what you like hearing because it reinforces your view. If you are somebody who rethinks and challenges, you are not an expert, you are a maverick. <laughs> Okay, you are disruptor. You might even be a revolutionary, although I may not like your tactics as a revolutionary or whatever. But you're actually, we need to remember 
that as science moves on really fast, we have to adapt our thinking and not be rigid. And it is easier to stick and recite what other people have said before than it is to say, actually, no, we're now with a different situation. And I think ventilation is a good example of that. When I was at medical school, there was no non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. You know, ventilator with a mask on and so on unheard of. The best you could hope for would be a tracheostomy and a machine that wasn't as big as a car, really. I mean, they, they were huge, great cape ventilators. Now, you can have a little ventilator that is portable. And a colleague of mine in the House of Lords has non-invasive ventilation. She has her mask on, nasal She's learned to speak with it, she gives speeches, and it's on the back of her wheelchair, okay? Unthinkable 10 years ago. But if that ventilator stops, she will be dead within probably an hour or so. So, you know, it is keeping her artificially alive. She's the oldest living person in the UK with spinal muscular atrophy. I've known her from when she was a child, and when we were, when she was seven and eleven, we thought she was going to die then. Now, the problem is that the people who are reiterating these phrases and saying you're killing people have not kept up with the reality of technology. So we have a lot of people who are living very well in a way that they could not have lived before. They may have parenteral feeding, gastrostomy feeding overnight, dialysis at night, transformed actually, renal dialysis overnight, far better outcomes than renal dialysis in the day. So we're changing medicine all the time to improve the quality of the, of, of the lives, the way that people live, let them do more. But we must be aware they all would have died of their disease previously. And when they say, enough is enough, when my gastrostomy tube falls out, I don't want it replaced, but please look after me. I've had enough, I just want to stop my ventilation, please look after me. We're not killing them, they're dying of the disease that they would have had before. And that is fundamentally different to taking or giving patient effectively a massive dose of poison. Because that's what you're doing with assisted suicide or euthanasia. Person would have lived, could have lived well, you're cutting life off. And I think that is deliberately fudged by the campaigners who want to dance on the head of a pin to say, oh, but you're really killing your patients anyway. No, we're not. We're actually caring for them and we're listening to what they need. Good morning. Ah. All right. Uh, I'm Patrick Lord. I'm on the faculty here at Georgetown in Qatar, and I have the pleasure uh, to introduce our two speakers uh, for this session, for this panel, on the interface between uh, religion and medicine at the end of human life. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction of the two speakers, and then uh, um, Dr. Suleiman will speak, I guess, for about 30, 40 minutes, right? And Father Sheehan will be the second speaker, and then we'll have hopefully some time for discussion. So, uh, Dr. Merunisha Suleiman is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center of Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge. Her research involves an ethical analysis of the experiences of end of life care services in the United Kingdom from Muslim perspectives. Is the sound good or is there an echo? Yes, there's, a, yeah, there's a, some kind of echoing. Dr. Suleiman holds um, a, a doctorate in population health from the University of Oxford and a BA in biomedical science tripos from the University of Cambridge. She also holds a medical degree and an, a Master of Science in Global Health Sciences from the University of Oxford. 
She's worked with Sir Muir Gray on the Department of Health QIPP Right Care Program. She's an expert for UNESCO's Ethics Teacher Training Program and was also awarded the 2017 National Ibn Sina Muslim News Award for Health. She has an Alimiya degree in traditional Islamic studies, which she was given under the supervision of Sheikh Akram Nadwi at Al Salam Institute in 2013. Our second speaker is Father Miles Sheehan, uh, who is an assistant for senior Jesuits for the USA Northeast and Maryland provinces of the Society of Jesus. Father Sheehan joined the New England province of Jesuits on August 25, 1985, and he made his novitiate at St. Andrew House in Boston. Then he was ordained to the priesthood in 1994. In 2005, he professed solemn vows in the Society of Jesus. Father Sheehan was born in Massachusetts and graduated from Dartmouth College in 1978 and from Dartmouth Medical School in 1981. He trained in internal medicine at Boston's Beth Israel Hospital from 1981 to 1984, and he received further training in geriatrics from the Harvard Ger Geriatric Fellowship Program uh, from 1989 to 1991. From 1992 to 1995, Father Sheehan was the recipient of a Brookdale Foundation Fellowship in Geriatrics. And he then, uh, a few years later, received a faculty fellowship from the Project on Death in America. And he developed the Recovering Our Traditions curriculum aimed at improved end of life care in the Catholic community. Finally, Father Sheehan was named one of Chicago's top doctors yearly from 2002 to 2010. In 2007, Father Sheehan was named a fellow of the American College of Physicians, and he currently serves as a member of the board of directors of Bon Secours Mercy Health System. Please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Suleiman, first, our first speaker. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So the world is made for tall people being vertically challenged. I'm going to sort of stand to the side, but I might annoy whoever it is that's responsible for the sound system. So if I start veering off this way, then just, yeah, tell me to shove along. Um, so, yeah, exactly, exactly right. So what I'm gonna do is tell you a little bit about the research that I've been doing in Cambridge over the past couple of years. I'm a clinician by training, but I've been moving moonlighting in the humanities for the past couple of years. So any humanities scholars, I apologize from now. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a pretender. Um, what I'll do is I'll give you a little bit of a background about the demographics of Muslims in the UK that will give you a little bit of a flavor of how it is that my study is situated within the broader narrative of the thinking about palliative and end-of-life care in the UK. And what I'll do in particular is uh, tell you a little bit about the data related to trust building uh, when we think about uh, Muslim patients and families' experiences of end-of-life care in the UK. So a little bit of data. As somebody who uh, spends her spare time number crunching, uh, says something a little bit about my mental state, I can't but help share some data with you. Um, the UK population um, is presented here, particularly the Muslim population, where almost 5% of the population um, is, is Muslim. That's almost one in 20. Of course, that varies depending on the parts of the country that you go to. So you'll bump into more of them in a city like Birmingham and, and very few in southern parts of the country. Um, in terms of the age profile of the population, a significant number um, are aged under the age of 15. 
Uh, so, so this may beg the question, why on earth is she thinking about palliative and end-of-life care from Muslim perspectives? I'll get back to that in a second. But one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is looking not just at the faith perspectives of this population, but also the underlying values and negotiations that are underpinned by the ethnic diversity. And, and, and that's summarized in the, 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 the picture over there, but will emerge from some of of the data that I, that I share with you shortly. Health inequity, health inequality is something um, that is of particular relevance when we're, when we're thinking about ethics in healthcare. And a very important finding from the most recent census was that Muslim women in particular uh, report a higher level of ill health um, than the, the national counterparts. And that's something that's very, very important when we're thinking about access to healthcare services and particularly palliative and end of life care services. Um, and this is particularly true of, of, of women and men over the age of 65, but particularly women. Thinking more deeply about um, health inequalities um, related to this population, what we find is a significant proportion of the Muslim population live in the most deprived um, local authorities um, in, in, in England. And, and this relates to other uh, aspects of the social and um, uh, the social context of health and illness in terms of education level, access to employment, um, the types of housing, and all of these impinge on their experience of, of, of health and their access to, to healthcare services. So here it is, as, as a number cruncher, the temptation of showing you a population pyramid. So you can see that um, the pyramid is, is bottom heavy, but what you see is there is a significant population of Muslims aged um, aged in their, in their 40s and 50s currently, and you can see that the population that will be 55 and, and 74 will, will more than double um, by 2021. And I think this is very, very important when we're thinking about planning for services that meets the needs of an increasingly diverse population in the UK, and particularly a population that has experiences of low socioeconomic influences. There have been a few studies that have been done looking at palliative and end-of-life care issues related to minority communities in the UK. These studies are, are few and far between, but I wanted to um, highlight the study done by Jonathan Kaufman and colleagues at King's College London. It's a fabulous piece of work. And, and one of the big things that they point out where there's very little study and there's a need for more work is unmet needs and disparities related to palliative and end-of-life care, particularly in relation to religious and family issues. Um, and also how these religious and family issues relate to end-of-life care decisions. But as a, as a healthcare professional, one of the things that the report highlights that was particularly pertinent um, and, and resonated with some of the experiences that I've had and um, experiences that colleagues have had is when interacting with people from minority communities in relation to palliative and end-of-life care decisions, healthcare professionals often face uncertainty and anxiety in, in that sort of setting. So, so this got me thinking, you know, how is it that we can address this issue, this issue of a minority population's views not necessarily being cap captured um, within the data set, but also that healthcare professionals themselves face anxiety and uncertainty when trying to meet the needs of the population that they serve. Um, so this led me on to the, the, the last two years of work that I've, that I've been doing. And, and what I started with is look, started looking at the policy documentation around end-of-life care. And as, as most of you know, and a lot of this was, was brought up yesterday, the UK is a leader in palliative and end-of-life care. A lot of the strategic thinking uh, around this area of work began in 2008 with the national strategy on end-of-life care. And a lot of policy documentation has followed on from that, one of which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence's guidelines that were updated in 20. And one of the things that the guidelines point out is around diversity, equality, and language. And, and what the guideline emphasizes is that the care um, and treatment that healthcare professionals provide ought to be culturally appropriate, but also the information 
that they provide. So this, this resulted in more, more head scratching, more thinking. How do healthcare professionals do this? Or how can they do this? How ought they provide this, this, this excellent standard of care? Rummage through the rest of the NICE guidance, very little there. Rummage through the other 25 documents that seemed relevant from Department of Health, NICE, Public Health England, et cetera, guidelines, very little documentation. Um, one of the things that the NICE guidance does point out is what is important within uh, the palliative and end-of-life care framework and, and, and what was reiterated over the past couple of days is, is spiritual support. And for some people, spirituality is conferred from organized religion. So when I started looking at the literature around the influence of organized religion, particularly Islam, on end-of-life care decisions, studies were few and far between. And that stimulated me to, to set up this research, but also that the Muslim population is incredibly diverse demographically. It's an aging population. And interestingly, there are intergenerational differences that reside within families, particularly when we're thinking about palliative and end of life care, which is understudied. We think of, um, we think of populations as, being defined with their languages, their cultures, their religions, and, and often think that family units are a way of us studying one, one defined reflection of that. But what, what I found in the research and, and, and what other ethnographers discuss is that in, in a population like the UK, which has um, migrants, but also first, second, third generations, all living together or living very close by, you have different value systems coexisting. And when these interface with the healthcare setting, particularly end of life care, this raises questions and moral challenges that can be very, very difficult for, for healthcare professionals. So one of the key things that I've been looking at in my research is from the perspective of patients and families, what are their personal preferences? Are there religious values and beliefs that define those personal preferences? And from the perspective of healthcare professionals, how do they ensure that treatment and care and the information they provide is culturally appropriate? And are there barriers, challenges, and facilitators that they encounter? So as, as any good researcher would do, sort of use a tiered methodology to do this. Some of, some of it was about looking at the academic literature, the gray literature, but what I've also been doing in, in my spare time, lots of weekends and evenings, is looking at LexisNexis and, and, and Bailey sort of case law. Anybody who's interested, uh, please let me know. I won't be summarizing the case law here, um, but I have found at least 11 cases in the last two decades involving Muslim um, patients and families who've challenged healthcare professionals um, in making end of life care decisions. Unfortunately, in all of those cases, they've ended up in court because they haven't been resolved in that healthcare setting. Many of those were best interest decisions, interestingly enough. Um, one of those was about the distinction between um, a minimally conscious state and a persistent vegetative state, which was very interesting. Uh, but yeah, I, I said I won't talk about them, but <laughs> you can see I'm... Yeah, exactly, they are too interesting. But what, what I'll tell you about is the, the qualitative part of the work, my conversations with healthcare professionals, patients, families, chaplains, coroners, um, community imams, basically anybody who'd speak to a nosy researcher about their involvement in palliative and end-of-life care decisions. I've been doing the interviews primarily in London and Birmingham because they have the highest Muslim population in the UK. Cambridge also because it gives a good sort of contrast with the minority population. I'm also trying to save the university travel costs on, on train tickets, um, which seem to be getting more and more pricey as days go by. Um, I've done 74 interviews so far, just waiting to speak to a couple more coroners. They seem to be an elusive bunch or uh, are avoiding me like the plague. So if you know anybody um, who's a coroner in the UK who'd be willing to talk to me then, please let me know. Um, yeah, they are busy people. Um, so a lot of the themes coming out from the data can't really be summarized in a PowerPoint, um, sparing you the 13 pages of NVivo codes here by putting them down into three main blocks. And 
When I've been speaking to lots of the different stakeholders, a lot of the issues can be summarized related to the medical interventions that become pertinent when thinking about um, an end of life care. And, and some of those have been mentioned today in terms of um, DNA CPR, withholding and withdrawal of treatment, um, as well as more um, nuanced issues around assessment of, of quality of life and best interests. The other are um, values pertaining to end-of-life care decisions, which I'm particularly interested in, um, especially this issue of balancing commitments like life is sacred and, and how it is that that manifests within, within clinical settings where patients and families are trying to hold on to hope and acceptance concurrently and healthcare professionals are really struggling with trying to provide them with the information that they need in order to make decisions, but at the same time being an, aware that they don't want to um, diminish the hope that patients and families may, may be expressing or may be committed to. What I want to tell you a little bit more about is the sorts of decision makers, the, the authority um, that underlies the, the, the trust building in, in um, end of life care decisions involving Muslim patients and families. And, and those sorts of people include patients and families themselves, um, religious scholars, um, chaplains who may be scholars but interface with the healthcare setting as experts negotiating between patients and families, and also the healthcare team. I, I know they've been listed in in uh, in an order there, but um, that's that's not intentional. So, when we're thinking about trust building. Hospice nurses in particular talk about how trust building can be particularly challenging for them because they aren't necessarily the most important person in, in the patient's life and may not be throughout that um, end of life care journey. Uh, one of the hospice nurses in, in Birmingham talked about how she's found that Muslim families are more together as families. They often live locally, um, which is really supportive. But she was explaining that, you know, we often think that we're very important at this stage of life. Uh, but what we find is that they may be getting advice from a lot of different places. And we need to know that that's, that that's happening. Um, the result of that is that nurses like herself find it very difficult to really know what it is that the patient wants. It's often the family who is in charge, and it's often the family who the patient relies on to, to make those sorts of decisions. Some of that um, is, is complexified by interpreters or issues around um, English proficiency. Uh, and what, what we found is that Families who are having care at home often have a family member who steps in to be an interpreter. And usually hospice staff use that as a proxy initially because it's already become very difficult for them to step into the home. You know, having the trust to be able to enter somebody's private space and be able to provide that care for the patient. So, so they're accepting of a family member being an interpreter. But what nurses say is sort of another head scratching moment. You know, I spend two or three minutes explaining something and the family member transmits this information with a few words. And so they say, either English is the most inefficient language or something is really being lost here in, in terms of transmission of that information. And then it becomes very, very difficult for them to then bring an external interpreter once a family member has already stepped into that role. Um, negotiating that transition can often be problematic. However, bringing in an external interpreter as a first step can also be a challenge. So it's not an easy one either way. The other is that when we think about a lot of the surrounding socioeconomic um, context of these populations, their trust in institutions other than the healthcare system is something that is particularly pertinent. So in London in particular, a lot of the chaplains, a lot of the healthcare staff talk about Muslim families not really having trust in the healthcare system. You know, they, they say they, they just don't trust the medical system. And, and I don't think that's just um, specific for the Muslim population. There is this paradoxical relationship of successes in medicine um, having an inverse relationship with trust in the healthcare system. Honor O'Neill's work on that is, is, is particularly relevant. 
I'm sharing with you this very sensitive and, and particular case, but it's often very helpful for healthcare professionals who've encountered difficulties with families to understand what may have been going on here. One of the healthcare assistants in London talks about how providing palliative and end-of-life care in particular is incredibly sensitive. It's very personal, is emotionally wrought for the healthcare staff themselves as well as patients and families. And when Muslim families take it upon themselves to care for their elderly, care for their loved ones, care for their ill, they find it very, very difficult to hand over that care. There is a real tension, be that cultural, theological, moral, or simply a very personal one, where they have a very long-standing relationship with their loved one, and it's very, very difficult for them to hand over that care. And some of that tension then may present itself in, in a dramatic way. So, so what the healthcare assistant was saying that this family in particular, a lot of them were doctors, a lot of them were healthcare professionals. And because they were so worried, what they did was they set up cameras everywhere around the house. And this was very, very difficult for the nursing staff and for the healthcare assistants. And it's only after repeated conversations with the GP and with the family that they were really able to understand the underlying reason for that. And often when I present this quote to um, healthcare professionals across the board, you know, they sit back and sigh, um, have the sigh of relief, and they say, you know what, we, we've had these sorts of things. And now that you mention it, maybe it was for the same reason. I know I mentioned this issue of English proficiency. I want to say that translation in, in this sort of setting doesn't just involve language in and of itself um, in, in, in terms of English being an, an issue. What I found is that religious knowledge and language is particularly pertinent when Muslim patients and families are negotiating end-of-life care decisions. And what they need are interpreters of a different sort. They need people who are equipped in religious knowledge and religious language to interpret for them, uh, help them with meaning making around end of life, particularly when, when trying to make sense of religious values like um, life is sacred, and, and I'll come on to that. Um, some of this, however, is, is also pertinent when we think about the normative implications of best practice within palliative and end-of-life care. So hospice nurses talk about advanced care planning as being central to their role in being able to understand what patients want at the end of life, know when it is that they're providing the right sort of care, and particularly once the patient um, dies, for them to have that reassurance that they did everything possible to meet the needs and the wishes of their patient. Advanced care planning, however, is met with varied responses from Muslim patients and families. And, and what hospice nurses say in particular is, we often have these sorts of conversations in parallel. The patient says to us very respectfully that, look, I understand you have a job to do, but God will take me when, when he's ready. And I don't really have to think about these things. I don't really want to think about these things. And, and so the nurses say, you know, sometimes I have to step back and think, you know, is this for me or is this for the patient? Um, and, and, and so this, this got me thinking, you know, when we, when we think about the broader um, implications of this in terms of the training that healthcare professionals need, how it is at the policy level, we, we measure good palliative and end-of-life care. What is the role of normative measures like advanced care plans in these sorts of set, settings? And do we need to adapt them? And if so, how and to what extent? The other is, um, it's really, really important for us to um, have a think about the role of, of hospital chaplains, uh, particularly chaplains who have um, a role in serving their community also. Uh, one of the chaplains in London talks about how families really don't know what it is that the faith perspectives are in these sorts of situations. They often rely on him to, to tell them, well, is the DNA CPR form okay? You know, this is what the doctor said. Is that okay for us? And sometimes it's simply about him reassuring them that that's okay. It can be deeper than that, which is him trying to interpret for them what life 
is sacred in these sorts of contexts, that it is okay for them to accept the prognosis that they have been given, and that if that involves um, negotiating a ceiling of treatment with the clinical team, then that's something that they can, they can accept. And the families rely on him heavily to do that. So you can see that in this sort of situation, the authority li lies not with the clinical team when the patients and families are making decisions, but with a chaplain who's very deeply rooted in the community also, but also has an understanding of the clinical context. Some of that, however, is, is muddied by people who have an authoritative role, but primarily in the community. So you have imams in the mosque who, when consulted, would err on the side of intervention. And this is where conflicts arise, where if a family speaks to a hospital chaplain and they give them one impression or one opinion, they go to the community-based imam who may say something else. And, and what hospital chaplains often say is, you know, they, they, they have this misinterpretations. Families see that they've turned over to the dark side because they're, they're working in that hospital setting. So when thinking about this question of authority, it's not something that's, um, uh, it's, it really is multifactorial and, and needs to be unpicked. Um, and, and it's complicated further when we think about uh, the implications of this uh, in relation to palliative and end-of-life care decisions. This is a, a, really, a really sad story um, of a, a young family where the mum had um, a terminal illness and her family decided that they wanted her to be um, for organ donation. And they negotiated this and, and they thought that this was the right thing to do. When a local imam came to the hospital because he was the one who was going to be doing um, her funeral rites and, and burial, um, the family told him that um, this is what they were going to do and that the hospital was going to organize it for them. He said, no, 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 you can't do this. You can't donate her organs. And although the family had thought about this before, they knew that there were differences of opinions um, from within the Islamic tradition because this person was the gatekeeper in terms of the mosque itself, the funeral rites and the burial rituals, they found it very difficult to um, continue that decision and, and withdrew the permission. Um, and, and, and it was something that was very, very difficult for them. Um, and, 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 and this was something that's... Uh, this is something that's, that sparked conversation in, in multiple meetings because it, it does raise the issue of where these sorts of conversations should be happening. So I want to bring some of this together and, and, and what I like to say at this stage is this isn't half-baked, it hasn't even gone in the oven yet, so, so, so just bear with me. Um, a lot of these sorts of issues um, around barriers and facilitators can be, can be summarized in terms of how it is that we think about expectations within, within healthcare. Um, Baroness Finlay mentioned her work this morning. Um, uh, Honora O'Neill's work talks about how autonomy and trust within, within bioethics is something to do with, with mismatches. Uh, between advances in medicine and decline in trust um, due to the lack of education and, and poor communication. So when we consider these, these barriers to accessing good palliative and end-of-life care, is some of it about our lack of understanding of what the aims of, of palliative um, and end-of-life care is? Maybe. Is some of it to do with us not knowing the limitations of intensive care, particularly in the case of those, those legal cases? Maybe. Um, is, is some of it to do with poor communication? Yes, also. Um, so can we then remedy this by educating patients and families, giving doctors um, and um, sort of healthcare professionals across the board communication skills? To a certain extent, I think what, what O'Neill's work points at and, and what Baroness Finlay was talking about this morning is it's deeper than that. You know, it's deeper than um, the, 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 those skills and, and that education. It is more about relationship building. And that relationship building takes time. It points to how end-of-life care decisions need to be happening much earlier on. And we need to be thinking about these sorts of things very practically in that community setting.
So some of that is also about us understanding more deeply how it is that patients and families and communities um, derive meaning making around end of life. They're the ones that are experts in these, these values and perspectives. Um, and that when we put all of these things together, the spaces within which this trust building occurs is also very, very important. And maybe hospitals and even hospices may not be the right, the right place for that, particularly in communities where accessing those services is in and of itself challenging. Um, although, although the work itself is focused on Muslim patients and families, I think um, there are a lot of lessons that we can derive in terms of other, other, other communities in the UK. Uh, what I've found is that chaplains are particularly important in trust building, and maybe there might be a role for Muslim community chaplaincy. And, and what I'm doing is, is, is starting um, conversations with an imam in London who has... Um, an outreach of 10,000 people. You know, he, he, he runs two Friday sermons um, and those, those sermons are attended by 5,000 people each. So that's a, an outreach of 10,000 people. Thinking about how it is that we can set up a Muslim, chaplain, Muslim community chaplaincy program where he can start having conversations with his um, mosque group about palliative and end of life care much earlier on. And is there a role for him working more closely with GPs in the area and also the hospice in his case, St. Christopher's, um, to try and promote these sorts of conversations. This does beg the question that if we have different people being involved in these sorts of conversation, does it prevent direct trust building between patients and families and healthcare professionals? I'm just going to put that out there as a question because that's something I'm still mulling over. Um, I feel like I've talked for a long time, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am deliberately said Muslim, medicine and religion at the end of life, a Catholic perspective rather than Christian. Catholics are, of course, part of Christianity. But I'm going to be speaking more personally, perhaps, than individuals have before. And just to tell you a little bit of my story, um, I was born in 1956, south of Boston. Uh, my family is of Irish heritage. And I did not realize it at the time, but I grew up in a very Catholic family. Uh, I thought everyone went to church multiple times a week. Um, I thought that it was common for everyone to be saying grace to do that. Now, our Catholic identity was also built up in a little bit of resistance to the local Yankee culture for the people who had been the establishment in the past and who had treated Irish immigrants perhaps not so well. And so there were multiple elements with the Catholicism. It identified who you were as a person. It provided a link to our heritage back in Ireland with my great-grandfather having come in 1882. Uh, it provided a way of distinguishing, and particularly when John F. Kennedy was elected president, the first and the only Catholic president of the United States, it was also a sense that you could be fully an American and fully a Catholic in that position. Now, one of the things that I grew up with as a little Catholic boy south of Boston and part of the Irish tradition was death was an everyday part of life. And so that to show you what I heard called as my Catholic worry beads, uh, is that one of the prayers we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. That was the first prayer I learned when I was probably two or three years old. So the idea that from the beginning of life you were preparing for death was something that was very big. That latched on to an older tradition within Christianity and Catholicism that could be called the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. And one of the important things that one did was to pray for the grace of a happy death. How was a happy death defined? It was not defined in terms of doctors. It was not defined in terms of hospital care. It was defined in terms of having the priest available to have your confession, to receive the last sacraments, which we now call sacrament of the sick, but perhaps more terrifying in the past was called extreme unction, unction meaning anointing. And that was a way in which one viewed essentially the passage into heaven was relatively assured. 
Once someone died, it was crucial to have a funeral service that was often fairly elaborate. And then 30 days later, and then every year, one would remember a relative who died. So I still will say mass for my grandmother, who died in 1966 at the age of 85, and perfectly good old lady death, which I say respect. But again, this idea that there is a certain permeability between the realm of the living and the dead, and that we need to be conscious of our transition to that, is something I grew up with. When I had my medical training, particularly when I began my residency in Boston, I thought everyone was insane. I did not understand why very old people were being taken to the intensive care unit, and from my perspective, torture. I did not understand, and I trained at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, which is a Jewish hospital, but many of the people, and there was a couple different things. People from the Orthodox Jewish perspective would have, how you would say, very conservative positions and often insist on medical care in ways that perhaps one could define as futile. This was very hard for me to accept. And I think my interests, both in geriatrics, which I finally specialized in, as well as caring for people at the end of life, came from my religious tradition, as well as the experience here that the idea of dying as something that is natural, normal, part of life, and part of our story with God was something that was not shared with other people. What I found as I went on and actually became an attending physician and part of the faculty at this hospital, many of the people with conferences would say, why do you want to have a Catholic priest at a Jewish hospital talk to you about death and dying? They say, your tradition is 2,000 years. When it gets a little older, it might mature, but we'd like to hear where you are right now. With that in mind, uh, as I went through further training, I ended up um, at Loyola University Medical Center, which is a Jesuit Catholic center just outside the city of Chicago, whoops, and in time became in charge of education at the medical school while having a practice. For my academic work, I worked in looking at ways in which we could improve end-of-life care, particularly within Catholic healthcare in the United States. Catholic hospitals constitute about 17% of the hospital beds within the United States. So it's the largest singly identifiable provider of health care. In the 1980s and 90s, I would say end-of-life care was lousy in Catholic hospitals. And I think one of the original things was to begin to work with people. So getting people to use morphine instead of meperidine or Demerol, teaching people the right medications to use, but also people who had no real sense of the tradition, and you might run into this again with Islam and Muslim societies, where people would often have it just wrong as to what the tradition is. And particularly, you would find people who had been secular or who had left the faith often decided they had to be more Catholic than the Pope when their mother was dying. When I would teach my medical students at Loyal Medical Center, I would always, in the introductory effort, I, before I'd show them the slide, I would say, true or false, life on earth in the Catholic tradition is absolute. And they'd all put, they will say it's absolute. Well, they're absolutely wrong. Because our life on earth in the Catholic and the Christian tradition is secondary to our larger tradition of eternal life. As a little boy, I learned these questions from what we call the catechism. Who made you? God made you. Why did God make you? To know him, love him, and to serve him, and to enjoy eternity with him in the next world. What is the purpose of our life? If you want to be philosophical, what is our telos? The purpose, the goal of our life is eternal life with God. Therefore, to fuss too much about the transition is problematic. And so what John Paul II wrote in an encyclical called Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life, and so man, humanity, is called to a fullness of life which far exceeds the dimensions of earthly existence because it consists in sharing the very life of God. The loftiness of the supernatural vocation reveals the greatness and the inestimable value of human life even in its temporal phase. 
After all, life on Earth is not an ultimate, but a penultimate reality. In other words, right next to ultimate. Even so, it remains a sacred reality entrusted to us. Now, what would happen in the 1990s when I would trot out to various Catholic groups and I would say life in the Catholic tradition is not an absolute value is someone would get up and call murderer, heretic, liar. That's why I would often show slides with authoritative quotes. Through the grant I had from the somewhat ominous sounding project on death in America, I was able to work fairly extensively in doing a lot of educational work and begin to work particularly with the physicians in Catholic healthcare who could be extraordinarily, the word conservative isn't right because it's conservative means you're trying to conserve something. They were simply ignorant. They were holding on to something that was wrong and implying it was right. A quote from John Paul II that I always found remarkable, um, both the artificial extension of human life and the hastening of death, although they stem from different principles, conceal the same assumption. The conviction that life and death are realities entrusted to be human beings, beings to be disposed of at will. It must be made clear again that life is a gift to be responsibly led in God's sight. Now what I've heard over the last two days from Muslim scholars has been that that would be, I believe, completely consistent with what went here in Islam. In other words, that my life did not come because I made it, my life came because God gave me life. And although there are details about how I will exit this life, the timing of that exit is essentially up to God. But most importantly, this idea that life is a gift given to us is profoundly countercultural within the United States and probably Western Europe. What do you mean it's a gift? I'm an autonomous individual. Autonomy is not the highest value in the Roman Catholic tradition. The highest value is living a life of fidelity to God. That doesn't mean that you take other people's rights away, but it does mean that as I, an individual, realize that the most important thing I can do is to love God, serve God, know God, and to hope for eternity with him in the next. Now, I'm going to go through these quotes from a thing called the Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Healthcare in the United States. One of the things that's very different, I believe, from Islam is that Catholicism has lots of central authority. And in some ways it's a blessing, there are other days it's not so wonderful, but that's a whole other story. But the point with that is that it is possible to give what is considered authoritative teaching. Just to talk a little bit about how, what are the sources that Catholics respect? We respect scripture and tradition. What I'm doing today is talking to you mostly about tradition, and from scripture and tradition, authoritative teaching comes forth. There's a word in Latin for it, it's called the magisterium. It means the teaching authority of the church. So these documents would be part of the magisterium. The ethical and religious directives are those specifically used in the United States. However, they're approved by the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith in Rome, and thus they have, you know, the blessing from the central church. There are multiple sections in there, but one of them is on care for the dying. And again, what I used to do and still do when I'm doing my little dog and pony show throughout the United States at Catholic hospitals is again, the biggest problem I have often are physicians who were maybe trained at a Catholic college and they have it absolutely wrong. That slide I showed you from John Paul II about life as a gift to avoid the two extremes between deliberate killing and over-treatment. The constant refrain I heard in the 90s and early 2000s is we have to do everything, no matter what. Otherwise, I'm killing the patient. What that quote from John Paul helped people to understand the people who do euthanasia and the people who do everything, they're flip sides of the same coin. They are pretending that they have agency over life and death, and they are thus usurping God's role, and thus not right. Now, what should a Catholic healthcare institution be like? Well, it's meant to be a witness to his faith, and these are some of the two poles, which is a tension in Catholic teaching. Human dignity in the individual, the community and solidarity. The community 
should be one that provides respect, love, and support to patients and families as they face reality of death. And then it goes on to talk about the difficulties that come with the end of life. But one of the primary purposes of medicine and caring for the dying is the relief of pain and the suffering caused by it. It's not avoidance of death. It's not aggressive measures. Effective management of pain in all its forms is critical in the appropriate care of the dying. What I used to do in working with Catholic healthcare, there are other parts about the ethical religious directives that deal with issues in reproductive health. As you may or may not know, a form of sterilization called tubal ligation is also forbidden in Catholic healthcare. I would ask the people, I go, do you allow tubal ligations at St. So-and-so Hospital? And they go, oh, no, Father. And I go, well, how many people on the floor in the hospital are in serious pain and you're not treating them? They go, what do you mean? I go, that is as much as a violation of church teaching as is the tying off of a fallopian tube. And that allowed some people to perhaps begin to understand that caring for pain was important. The task of medicine is to care even when it cannot cure. And again, here's the thing that I hear happening in the, in the Gulf states, certainly happens in the United States. How do you deal with technology? Well, where's the starting point? Human dignity? reflecting on the innate human dignity of human life, it's all its dimensions, and the purpose of medical care, avoids two extremes. The insistence on useless or burdensome technology, even when a patient can wish to forego it. And the other hand, the withdrawal of technology with the intention of causing death. In other words, here are the two extremes put in a specific way that the Pope was also talking about. Oh, I'm gonna put every machine on this person, no matter what, or, well, this isn't going well, and I want that person dead, so I'll remove, them. I'll remove the treatment. Neither of those extremes are possible. What is possible, though, is to withhold treatment when the person has decided that the burdens and benefits, and those are language that you will often hear in Catholic health care, the burdens are higher than the benefits. And burdens can consider pain, suffering, impact on the family, or expense. About palliative care, I think the important thing here is, again, uh, sometimes people would get crazy in the hospital with folks who were dying and they were receiving morphine. So there would be the endless things, hold the morphine if the respiratory rate is less than a certain thing, so that people would end up waking up in pain. The idea was to treat the pain to realize that there could be some complications from that, but to make sure that one was, if not, your intention was not to kill the person, it was to treat the pain. So make sure you treat the pain and recognize when somebody is dying otherwise that it is morally permissible. I used to give the medical students this example. God forbid I have metastatic prostate cancer. It's in my bones. I have pathologic fractures, both my femurs break. I've been through treatment, I am in agony. I hope someone will give me morphine for that pain. And if I'm still in pain and the next dose of morphine suppresses the circulation, and there's some pharmacological issues here that are not as straightforward as we used to think. But if in this situation it ends up that the next dose takes my life, okay, because there is a reasonable, there's a reason to tolerate the evil of my life ending. The difference is if, and the students would like this, pretend I was skateboarding and I did a flip and landed and broke both my femurs. To control the pain of two broken femurs is tough. And you might not be able to do that with a morphine drip without getting me into trouble. Would it be okay to kill me if I had two broken femurs from my skateboarding? Well, one of the medical students raises his hand and goes, we've suffered enough from you, so we think that would be fine. <laughs> but the converse here is to say, yes, you can be aggressive with that. What about the key points? Medicines to care for the dying. Effective pain control and relief of suffering is crucial. Technology must be evaluated, not used blindly, and you avoid over-treatment and killing. I'm gonna just provide a couple quotes from the popes now. And again, this is part of what I would do in the United States because I would say palliative care is important, all that. And people say, that's not so. That's not so. One of the things within Catholic healthcare is the question of who has the authority. 
So even as a physician and as a priest, people go, well, you're saying something I'd like to hear is true, but is it okay? Did the Pope say it? Which is not exactly what Catholic teaching is about. However, um, it does provide reassurance that what the church teaches in these particular situations is quite reasonable. Benedict XVI spoke about palliative care uh, about 12 years ago, talking about all the difficulties that can come with a life-threatening illness. And he talks about, despite the advances of science, a cure cannot be found for every illness. So again, we have papal recognition that everyone will die. So again, I hope that that helps everyone. Uh, but the most important thing, and damn it, this thing didn't get put in here. Sorry. There is a third slide that I wanted to say where he talks about palliative care is an essential human right. And so uh, I'm sorry that slide didn't get in here. That there is Palliative care is an essential human right, and so that has been used in an authoritative declaration by the Pope, um, which is probably worth noting when one is advocating for palliative care within Catholic health care systems. Is that in the same? It is, it is. And Pope Francis, this is his um, day of the sick message for next month. He said, the categorical imperative is to never abandon the sick. I don't know what Immanuel Kant would say about that, but I, I think it's worthwhile. Uh, the anguish associated with the conditions that bring us to the threshold of human mortality and the difficulty of the decision we have to make may tempt us to step back from the patient. The point he's making there is one, again, the importance of human solidarity and community. One of the things I was speaking with Baroness Finley about is people have this misguided idea that one of the goals of medicine is to end suffering. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. We cannot end suffering. We can do really well with physical pain. We can do okay with many symptoms. However, there's still going to be psychological distress, spiritual distress. That's not within the doctor's ability to cure. The doctor or the nurse has a therapeutic role to play by listening, by paying attention, as does the whole healthcare team. The part that's difficult about this, and I think one of the reasons why assisted suicide and euthanasia are increasing in popularity, is it's very hard to be with someone who's dying. It's not as if they're jolly. And it can be difficult to face their mortality and to listen, to have to deal with your own. Having sat with my mother for many days before she died, and it's boring. She was asleep. I was saying prayers one day, and she got up, and she goes, sat up, and she goes, will you shut up? Those prayers are for you, not for me, and then went back to sleep. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things that takes a lot out of an individual. Palliative care, you know, the word comes from pallium, which means a cloak or a stole to pr protect you from the storm of illness. There is no magic of that without human intervention. And I'm hearing that clearly from the Islamic tradition, and it's at the heart of the Catholic tradition. This is where, more than anything else, we're called to show love and solidarity. Recognize the limit that we all share, that is, that we're going to die, and showing our solidarity. Let each of us give life in his or, love in his or own way, as a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, a brother, a sister, a doctor, a nurse, but give it. And I think this is one of the things to underline. Palliative care is a not another technique. It is meant to show the appropriate love and care that we humans should have for each other. The two great commands in Christianity, love your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Palliative care is an instantiation and in acting out of those two commandments. And he finishes, even if we cannot know that we cannot always guarantee healing or a cure, we can and must always care for the living without ourselves shortening their life, but also without futilely resisting their death. This approach is reflected in palliative care, which is proving most important in our culture as it opposes what makes death most terrifying and unwelcome, pain and loneliness. Now, it's interesting. So what does the Pope Francis say the point of palliative care is? The treatment of pain and the alleviation of loneliness. That's an interesting way to look at it. It's not to end all suffering. It's not every kind of wizardry possible. But it's technical expertise in the treatment of pain, and it's a human commitment to end loneliness. 
just a couple summary slides. So probably the big point that used to stun people is that medicine and life-giving efforts are nice, but the point of our life is not an eternity in the ICU. The point of our life is eternal life with God. Excessive treatment and burdensome treatments are both to be avoided because they have a fundamental misconception, the idea that life belongs in human hands rather than God's. Pain and symptom control are essential parts of Catholic health care. Euthanasia is forbidden. And then I mentioned those sources, the ethical and religious directors for Catholic health care. There are similar things in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And then statements from recent popes all affirm the essential nature of palliative care in the Catholic tradition. So thanks. I'd like to address the question, Dr. Suleiman, please. Uh, I'm going to preface it with uh, living in this part of the world, I find that uh, I have a cultural responsibility, which means for any kind of a crisis in the community which is not Muslim becomes mine or other clergy because there aren't identifiable clergy for other cultural traditions that exist here. Okay? I would challenge or at least posit uh, an aspect of your presentation. I really, really do affirm your call for better trained chaplains in hospitals. But I would reflect that the training is needed is cultural, not religious. Because a Muslim from an Arab country is going to have a different cultural issue about palliative care than a Muslim from an Indonesian country or from Pakistan or whatever. Uh, and so a, a greater diversity of cultural training. Also, of course, for a, a Japanese or Korean patient, um, th the issue is cultural, not religious, in my view. Thank you. Is uh, also for uh, Maronisha, and I was just um, wondering because uh, the Muslim population is as racially diverse as uh, as it is in in, in the UK. Um, to what extent do you think the distrust that the community feels has actually got more of a race racist basis than um, anti-religious bias, or is it a combination of both? Um, my, my question is are on similar on similar line. I want just to comment. Um, when I again I use your Irish experience. When I came to Ireland in the late 80s, people were shying away from working in pharmacy because they were afraid of dispensing oral contraceptives. And then it moves to the idea of uh, the referendum. The first referendum I watched in Ireland was on the legitimization of, uh, of, uh, of abortion and, uh, and so on and so forth. But now things are are moving differently. So that's that's the comment. But um, for uh, Dr. Suleiman, I think I agree with all the points that um, we are trying to, uh, and I, I observe this when I, because I'm trained outside my country, that we are trying to bring the ideas and, um, and uh, practices wherever we are trained and implement them in um, in uh, in in where we are in a different uh, and so you are the op on the opposite direction that you you have people from from diverse um, um, places diverse uh, even educational backgrounds diverse nationalities and we are trying to implement or or practice um, practices that we are using for that regional and and um, I, I have spoken about this yesterday, that um, <laughs> that we should have um, um, a, um, a suitably a suitably um, um, adjusted um, um, ways of dealing uh, with these issues that suits the community. Even if I, even if we have to educate the the, the, the health providers uh, for this uh, specific. Uh, so uh, while you write, Maronisa, because I have a question for you, but I want to first say uh, with Miles. So um, I wanted to get a, get a sense, uh, and I've heard this term several times, and, uh, notion of, of palliative care being a human right um, within the Catholic tradition, or at least being advanced as such. Uh, 
if that language is strategically deployed um, or is it intrinsic? And I only know, so I'm gonna say I've read some stuff of Jacques Maritain and this issue of human rights. So, so is this strategic deployment or is it sort of, how does it come about, right? How do you build that up? Um, the rest of the stuff I love, I mean, you know, you know each other, I love all the rest of the stuff you're saying, but that, that piece, how is it in certain, where is the rootedness and groundedness within the Christ tradition? Okay, um, Hermesa, so, um, <laughs> So here are my, uh, my, my, my questions taking on from what they said. So you mentioned and, and you said uh, education, we need education and we need trust for help with trust building. And you need, I think you said religious interpreters. Um, I get concerned uh, in my own empirical intervention work about us uh, potentially doing it in an ethically inappropriate way where we want to use religion as an instrumental vehicle for ends that are, may not be religious. I mentioned that yesterday about persuasion, right? That we, we, can't, we have this problem with there being a, we want to have overlapping religious and health ends, but maybe the health end is not one that's religiously okay, or maybe there's multiplicity of views. So if you're going to have a program of education in that modality, uh, and have religious interpreters that are helping people, where does the role go? Is it ethically appropriate to instrumentalize religious vocabulary for a health end? Um, and on, on that line, what's Muslim about this? In your presentation today, um, what is the Muslim dimension? I, I didn't quite grasp it, because you were trying to reference, like, is this strategic? That there are all these minorities, all these cultural issues, but what was Muslim about uh, what you found? It, it, the, the issue of rights talk in the Catholic tradition is, and there are people who know this much better than I, it, it is a relatively new move um, that probably started in the 80s, I believe, where the church would talk about rights. It was not opposed to rights before, but it had another set of language rooted in natural law, um, which looked in terms of what are the obligations that individuals had or the community had to the individual. I think the rights talk is meant to accommodate and provide a language that is more attractive in the current world. Coming from the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition of the church, rights are not the kind of thing that, it's not the language that's used. They're there, but it's a different set of language. I think the church is simply using a strategic way to teach and make its point. I find it strategically useful so that if I'm dealing with a Catholic health system that's retrograde in terms of their care for people at the end of life, I can say Pope Francis said it's a right, so you're a bad person and you have to do it, so. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much for all the questions. What I'll do is I'll um, go through them one at a time to, to, to respect the fact that they are distinct questions, but there may be some overlap. So the first one in terms of cultural training, absolutely. You know, what we're finding um, when we're doing workshops at hospices or hospitals or even out in the community, working with the local community so they are part of that training is very, very important. So those can be volunteers who work at the hospice, the local imam who works um, as a volunteer also. And these are people who are embedded in the community. They represent not only the faith perspectives, but also the cultural perspectives. And that becomes a very important part of the training for the healthcare professionals in that setting. So you're absolutely right. I mean, the purpose of the research is to, to tether the conversation around the Muslim perspective in the UK. But of course, I mean, because of the ethnic diversity, there will be, within the data set, variations. I have a presentation on that. I mean, we can, we can talk more about this. There was only so much that I could present in half an hour. And of course, some of that is uh, connected to how it is that I wanted to link the conversation around religious knowledge and authority that came out of the conversation yesterday. Um, so I hope that that addresses the first, first part of the question. Um, 
Dan, your question about racial diversity, absolutely. You know, so um, when I speak to particularly younger groups in, in London, some of that is about the, their experiences of racial prejudice. Um, but when we think about more broadly the experience of the Muslim population, not just in the UK, but in a lot of countries um, in, in in Europe and North America, some of that experience is also closely tied with their Muslim identity. Now, it may be that the perpetrator is being racist, but they may well interpret it as something connected to their Muslim identity. And I think that's something very important to consider. If that's their interpretation, then that's just as important as what's being intended by whoever it is that's hurling the abuse. So when my friends get called, or you Paki, um, it's not just about them being Pakistani when they're probably not, but they're identifying it as them being Muslim. So, so yeah, that's, I'm not sure whether that directly sort of delineates what it is you're saying, but it, it, it is a bit of both, yeah. Um, a very important point, you know, in, in terms of how we think about translocation of practices in, in one sense and then translocation of values in, in, in the other sense when we're thinking about the, the, the UK context. Of course, education is central to that. The point that I was trying to make at the end was beyond education, we need to really be thinking about the spaces within which this education and these conversations are happening. And these spaces ought to be spaces that are trusted by the people who are involved. And, and this is why doing this work in the community may be more important than doing this work in, in, in hospitals and in hospice settings. It's, it's, it's a gauntlet I'm setting up for myself, which is get out of your own space, safe space and, and really be out there speaking to the people on the ground to find out how it is that this will influence their day-to-day -day thinking about this sort of thing. Ooh, okay, how long do you have? So, so this is um, a, a deeper sort of methodological question. Um, as with most, most things, the answer is yes and no. So in, in, in some senses, it was easier. Um, you know, uh, reaching out to mosques in particular, uh, Despite being female, the, the imams have been very open, um, very conversant, incredibly candid in, in sharing their experiences, the sorts of challenges that they face. At the other side of the coin, I end up having conversations with people, and because I use in-depth interviews, I need them to verbalize something that may seem to them very obvious. So they say something, and I say, look, I, I understand, but would you be able to tell me a little bit more? And then they sort of look at me suspiciously, and they think, how can she not know what this is? And I have to explain to them, well, look, because it's research and it's not just an informal conversation, I need you to describe in your own words what, what that means. Um, so, so yes and no. Um, Dr. Asim, um, very important point. Uh, there is always that danger of uh, overlooking what the negative unintended consequences of any intervention. Uh, what I've been trying to do it, to mitigate that is, again, working more with the community in terms of what it is that they already consider to be problems. So when families themselves describe not having had these conversations earlier, not having had someone to hand to have these conversations earlier, then that in and of itself is a need. If we can equip people to facilitate these discussions, if we can train people to be more comfortable to press these sorts of issues, then um, hopefully we will be able to have communities where these sorts of issues are something that are more open in the mosque setting and, and in the family setting. You know, healthcare professionals say that they, they aren't able to talk about um, end-of-life care preferences with their own families. And these are people who are supposedly trained to have these sorts of conversations. 
Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, central to that is is relationship building, as in it's not going to just be one conversation that has a very distinct end. Um, it is about having those conversations that are robust, sufficient, longitudinal enough so that it does become that person's decision in the end, be that their own personal decision or the decision of their, their entire family. At the moment, what we find is that people end up at a cliff edge um, in a very acute situation where they really haven't had that the most precious resource, that time to think about these sorts of things. Um, the other question, um, what is Muslim about this? Again, how long do we have? You know, we can sort of get into this discussion about um, the implications of empirical work in being able to derive um, what it is that we can normatively understand. Uh, in terms of the, the presentation I gave here, the underlying commitments related to religious knowledge and religious authority is particular and is something that is not very well understood uh, and is um, an aspect of the research that, that I was trying to bring out. Some of it has to be considered within the context of uh, the multicultural, the multi-ethnic profile of the population, but there are particularities related to people's faith commitments and how it is that they embody those that is something that needs to be represented in, in terms of the data analysis. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, how you deal with the question of the religious belief in destiny, in fate, in Islam, what we call qada wa qadar? Uh, many people, they say, well, uh, I'm not sure about Christianity, but at least I'm talking about Islam. They believe in this date. I'm going to die anyway because it's, I, it's been decided when I was 40 days old, you know, um, earlier in life. So why should I worry about medical treatment? Why should I worry about this, about that? So how you deal with a situation like this? Uh, maybe in Christianity you have something similar to this belief anyway, so. I, I've been interested in the occasional references to how healthy it, it is to have a narrative, either Assam mentioning the 15 elders talking about uh, how we prepare for death, or Miles, you're mentioning uh, learning at two years old uh, that there are ways to approach death. And mostly our conversations here have been very enlightening, but they have been about a hard stop when death occurs and then, you know, we are separated from the family and the experience. Uh, but people bring their own narration or, or lack thereof. There are two things I'd uh, like to know. One, what uh, can we do to foster uh, this uh, uh, healthy uh, narrative about uh, understanding death so that it's not so shocking? I mean. It, the technology and foreignness uh, is, but other deaths occur around two things uh, that are common to the human condition. Uh, one is massive natural disaster that was mentioned yesterday, and the other is war. Uh, and I, I have many emails that end in the word peace, and then a name, but war has been present for a long time. And Drew Faust wrote a very interesting book about the US Civil War, The Republic of Suffering. And she essentially talked about how there was a uniform culture of um, the uh, Russ Merendi uh, that uh, people needed to hear the last words of a soldier or someone in a collateral damage. They needed to know something about what had happened. 
And I find that people still <coughs> want, want to know some of those things. Was there a signal uh, that uh, the dying person gave to uh, communicate to the end? Or since I've moved to the American Northeast, uh, people seem to uh, have the, uh, various rituals beyond funerals. They start nonprofit organizations related to uh, uh, in honor of a person or to fight a disease or a circumstance. But it does all center around the narrative and the ritual that happens after death and shapes the next experience that we will encounter with death. Uh, thank you both for very relevant <clears throat> and illuminating presentations. Um, I wanted to ask you about hospital chaplaincy services. In our university hospital, we have a multi-faith chaplaincy team. Uh, and I have wondered whether there are places where actually both the Muslim chaplain and the either Catholic or Christian, whichever denomination chaplain, should go together into situations such as the organ transplant one that you're talking about. Because actually by going together, they demonstrate an understanding of what is really happening. But they also are there demonstrate too that they're there to support everybody together, the clinicians as well as the patients and the, and the family. Whereas if you only go for the patient, you're kind of saying you need protection from these awful people in healthcare who are going to do things. Um, and uh, linked to that is the whole organ donation problem because I managed to get the UK government to pass uh, a regulation where you can have um, preferential donation. It is not directed donation, but it means that, and it was, it was designed to try to up donation from the different ethnic minority communities so that somebody can say that <clears throat> you know, my son, we, my son's organs are to be donated. We would like, if possible, and the kidneys match, to go to so-and-so who is in the extended family who's having dialysis is on the transplant list. And then all other organs can go into the pool. Um, because I, I think there, there is a real concern. The whole organ donation stuff can rebound. The Muslim community in particular often have diabetes, renal failure, need kidneys. So they're recipients, but they're not donors into the pool sometimes. And that is a real problem. And I think it's, you know, it, it would not make good headlines on a newspaper and it will damage everybody. Because the, if the organ donation pool goes down, nobody gets anything. Um, and linked to that and the concept of sharing, I also have a concern that some medical schools are now subtly filtering out prospective students who make it clear that they will have an opposition to euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. And that's beginning to happen in some medical schools in um, the Benelux countries, and it's happening in some medical schools in Canada. And I only know about it anecdotally, and I think it would be something that they would all deny. But I do think the intake needs monitoring as to how many of the students are able to express views. Because we know the same filtering goes on at the beginning of life. Girls who want to go into gynecology and obstetrics can find that they can't get on the training program. So they're filtered out before they even start. So there's this, this subtle move now, which I think is also part of a general anti-religion thing and which is why I said yesterday I think that rather than looking at all the differences between us all I wish we would say theist have a faith which guides us versus non-theist no faith because I think that non-theist bit is going to emerge as an increasing problem Thank you. Thank you very much for both presentations. Um, I've been thinking about, you know, the important work that Dr. Suleiman is doing and bringing us, and I think Dr. Asim also does some of this kind of empirical work. And 
while we've had a lot of discussion from both historical and normative positions on questions of palliative care, what I've heard here from the representatives of WISH, from Dr. Uh, Al-Hindi, from Oman, of the various kinds of attitudes people have that helps me identify a gap in the literature, at least when it comes to palliative care, is that we need a lot more medical anthropology. In other words, we need to study how people are experiencing things. Why do people in certain areas, for instance, say that we want to have this kind of redemptive suffering? This redemptive suffering is important for us. Whereas in other contexts, people would say, give me some kind of pain relief, right? Or there'll be different kinds of thresholds. So this is largely directed at Dr. Dalal, uh, that he might have to be open up this gap here of having medical anthropology of the region at his uh, very good university, but, uh, th th that, that, but, but at large, I think there is a need to fill this gap of medical anthropology, but here's the lacuna, uh, not sorry, the, here's the uh, kind of uh, warning, is that one must have this work of doing the anthropology in conversation with people who also know the tradition. But the tradition doesn't have the last word. The tradition can also learn from the experiences on, on the ground. So, but oftentimes I find anthropologists do their own thing with the stuff that they get, and they paint a picture that is not recognizable as to what it is that the people want. So, I mean, I, and, and that is a larger conversation, but I think it's important uh, in terms of, of, of our conversation here today. Thank you so much. The, the gentleman in the back who asked the first question um, regarding sort of a deterministic point of, well, it's already been ordained when I will die, so why should I bother with any planning? There's a tension with that, certainly within Christianity. I could not talk about Islam. Um, do I have, do I say prayers? Do I read the Psalms that say, indeed, you knew every one of my days before I was born? Um, there is always a tension, though, between what is predestined and what our free will is. And that's an endless argument, which I won't get into at this point. Um, but there is the tradition within Christianity is, how do I choose to have the best life possible in the light of what God has revealed to me? And to choose to have that best life that would be most suitable to the end that God has called me to, eternal life, how do I make my actions correspond to that end? So thus, I do have an advanced directive that says that if I am critically ill, I do not want my passing to heaven delayed. Do I believe that that influences what God does? No. Do I believe that that shows how I am responding to God's action in my life? Yes. So that I believe my actions are part of the ways I respond to what God has done in this world, and that my making choices are part of the ways in which I submit to what he has taught me through things. So uh, with Betty's question about narratives, um, I hadn't thought about narratives of disaster or narratives of war within this context. One of the things I did deliberately this morning was to talk about the narratives within a particular culture that I grew up with where death is part of the tradition and we would talk about the great wakes and funerals that people would have. There's a thing within the Catholic tradition, the Christian tradition called the communion of saints. So who is it that we live with? Well, that's the people who are alive now. They're the people who are dead and we're not quite sure where they are, this sort of indeterminate category in Christianity or Catholicism called purgatory. And then there are people who are in heaven. And so that whole group is always sort of a group of witnesses that are visible to us at that time, again, within the narrative structure that I grew up with. I think the problem with war, or particularly the problem with natural disaster, it's easy to see God's participation in the narrative with those three different groups. With something like a natural disaster, you know, with the tsunami, the number of questions with the tsunami in Indonesia in, what, 2000. Five? Yeah. <laughs> the number of people who came up to see how could God permit this? Because it's such a narrative that's interrupted that defies our reason. Again, it relates to the questions of theodicy that I'm not going to get into. The issues of war and narrative, I think those narratives get 
built into deliberate things like patriotism, love of country. Um, within, you know, I know that like within the traditions, say in the United States, particularly around the Second World War, how important church stories were and religious motivations for engaging against fascism so that people felt that they were obeying God's will, even as they knew Germans were being told the same thing. Um, but the, the natural disaster usually is a narrative about <laughs> evil and how do you deal with that. With the Baroness's question, which I think was mainly directed towards you, uh, the issue about what goes on with applications to medical school and selection of people to make sure that there are certain atheistic biases. Um, in the United States, it's protected by law. Um, you cannot ask medical school applicants about their positions on abortion, for example. That's specifically there. What happened when I applied to medical school? The guy said, I see that you say a lot about going to Catholic church. Well, I do abortions, and what do you think about that? I said, well, I think you're wrong. You could be a nice person. Um, it turned out he was... He was a radiologist. He didn't do abortions. He just wanted to see if I'd snivel and, and, and be nice to him so I'd get into medical school. Um, again, you never quite know what's going on with these crazy examiners, you know, and, and I think that the biases certainly get brought into that. So. Um, thank, thank you again for, for all of the questions. Um, <laughs> The issue you mentioned about fate, I mean, I'll sort of just build on what Miles was saying, which is it's something that I have encountered in, in my data set, both in terms of what it is that patients and families describe, but also what healthcare professionals encounter. So, you know, when they encounter patients who express what they would describe as fatalism, um, they put it down to patients saying, well, you know, if, if, if God's ready for me, then, that, then that's fine and I don't need anything. Um, from the perspective of scholars that I've spoken to, the way, the way they lay it out is similar to what, um, what Dr. Asim and Dr. Ayman have described in terms of the Islamic perspective on this, which is there are very few interventions that can be classified as curative. And what that then leaves us with is a huge margin for decision making. It may be that from the perspective of healthcare professionals, it's interpreted as fatalistic because they feel more optimistic about the intervention. But what the patient and or the family are doing is they're putting in perspective that other cycle of chemotherapy or the entire treatment regimen in the perspective of the life that they want to have um, in, in that um, end of life period. Um, so it is something that I've encountered in the data set. It probably is a much longer conversation in terms of what the underlying values are and how it is that fatalism can appear as acceptance in a certain concept and something very different in another con context. Um, but it's a very important question. Um, healthy narratives, really, really important issue. I think Miles has provided a very, very important response to that. Uh, in terms of the UK, UK setting, you know, how do we encourage these sorts of narratives? I'm the least popular person at a dinner party. Uh, all my friends say, don't ask her what she does, <laughs> or she's going to do her death talk. Um, and so everybody gets really intrigued. So they're like, what do you do? And then all my friends sort of hide under the table, and they're like, we're never bringing you to dinner again. But it's that thing of, you know, how do we have open conversations about something that is incredibly difficult? Um, I know I, I struggle with my own family and, you know, that's sort of really putting the cards out on the table when I find it so much easier with, with all of you. Um, it's, it, but it's something that we do need to challenge within ourselves. Um, but yeah, it's very, very important. Um, Baroness Finlay, 
we could we could have a very very lengthy discussion about the challenges related to organ donation. I think your suggestion of multi faith chaplaincy or having other people involved in that conversation is critical. <laughs> The challenge is that often in these situations, they're very time sensitive, and usually the people that you want around the bedside aren't available. And that's when things don't go as, as planned. But maybe by raising this issue um, more often, we can start to have um, conversations about um, getting multiple chaplains involved, for sure. Um, in terms of what you said about med school, I had a similar question when I was interviewed um, about euthanasia in particular. And he pushed and pushed and pushed. And I said, I'm sorry, you can ask me again, but my answer will be the same. Um, I, I wasn't aware of the implicit prejudice, uh, but that's something that maybe maybe we should look into more, more formally. Um, Prof. Musa, um, thank you so much. I, I, I feel like I should hand over to, to Dean Dalal to, to, to answer the first part of your question. He's shaking his head, so I won't put him on the spot. Um, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm moonlighting in the humanities, so I, I won't sort of put an anthropologist cap on. There is more work that needs to be done. You know, I'm, I'm trying to recruit people to do more of this work all the time, you know, if there are willing um, sort of participants in the audience, then then please please join us. There's there's a lot of work that needs to be done. You're right; there are methodological challenges, and I think that's something that we do need to be um, more open about. It it it, it doesn't. Um, it's not something that's resolved. It's not something that's methodologically fixed and does end up being sort of uh, a feedback loop that can prevent um, other types of knowledge and other types of influences being involved in that process. But yeah, no, it's, it's a very important point. <laughs> 